All praises to the Most High. So tonight's topic is called Murderous Red Dragons. That's tonight's topic. Murderous Red Dragons. Let, let's open up with the book of Ezekiel. We're going to open up with the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 35 and verse 1. We're going to start there. Okay, come on. Ezekiel chapter 35 verse 1. Read. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Read. Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. So the most High God is commanding Ezekiel to prophesy against Mount Seir. We're going to find out later on who is Mount Seir. Okay, go ahead. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will okay. make thee the, I will make thee most desolate. So the Lord is telling Ezekiel, he said, listen, prophesy against Mount Seir. He says, I'm against you, O Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against thee. I will make thee most desolate. So the Lord is promising to us through Ezekiel that he's going to make the land, the Mount of Seir, desolate. So the question is, who is Mount Seir that the Lord is going to destroy, that the Lord will bring forth vengeance against Mount Seir? Mount Seir is a nation of people, as a metaphor for a nation of people in these last days. Watch this. Give me the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 36, verse 1. Let's find out who is Mount Seir. Genesis 36 and verse 1. Let's read that. Come up. Genesis chapter 36, verse 1. Go ahead. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. The generations of Esau, who is Edom. Jump down to verse 8, come on. Genesis chapter 36, verse 8. Go ahead. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. You see that Esau. thing? He says, thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir, because Esau, Edom, Idumia, they dwelt in Mount Seir. Go ahead. Esau is Edom. Esau is Edom. So Esau, Edom is making reference to the same people who dwelt in Mount Seir. So what we're reading in Ezekiel is making reference to Esau, Edom. You understand who is called Mount Seir. Go ahead. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Esau is the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Okay, watch this. Give me the book of Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 4. Deuteronomy 2 verse 4. Let's get there. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 4. Come on. And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell mm -hmm. in Seir. We do what? which dwell in Seir. So now the Lord is commanding our forefathers through Moses, because this is our journey in the wilderness. You understand? So as we're journeying through the wilderness, the Lord is saying, listen, as you are journeying through the wilderness, you are going to pass the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Mount Seir. Okay, we read that in Genesis 36, verse 8 and 9. Go ahead. And they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Read on, come on. Meddle not with them, mm -hmm. for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breath, because yeah. I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. So the Lord says he gave Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. So when you hear Mount Seir, some, a lot of the times is making is a metaphor for Esau Edom. Okay, we're going to find out who Esau Edom is who is also called Mount Seir, which the Lord says he's going to make desolate. The Lord says he's going to destroy them. Okay, jump down to verse 12. Read. Deuteronomy, chapter 2, verse 12. Go ahead. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time. The Horims is but the Hamites. The Horims is the Hamites. The Horims is, the Horims is making reference to the Hamites. Go ahead. But the children of Esau succeeded them mm -hmm. when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead as Israel and did. Dwelt, and dwelt in their stead. 
So the children of Esau, they succeeded the, the Horems and kicked them out and dwelt in their stead in Mount Seir. Okay? So what we're reading here, the Lord gave Mount Seir to Esau for a possession. So what we're reading in the book of Ezekiel is making reference to Esau, Edom. Okay? Now, watch this. Let's get... Let's get the, the Zondervan. Give me the book of Isaiah. Okay, give me Isaiah 34 verse 5. Isaiah 34 verse 5. Let's get there. Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 5. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 5. Go ahead. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Mm -hmm. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia Wait. and upon the people of my curse to judgment. So what we're reading here, the Lord is prophesying through Isaiah that he's going to judge Idumia. So Idumia has not been judged yet. Idumia is going to be judged in these last days. Idumia who is also called Esau Edom, Mount Seir. The Lord says he's going to judge this nation. You understand? The people of my curse to judgment. Now let's get the definition of the word Idumia. Reading from the Zondervan Bible Compact Dictionary. Page 239, mm -hmm. Idumia, pertaining to Edom, Greek and Roman name for Edom. You see that Idumia says pertains to Edom, is the Greek and Roman name for Edom. So Edom is the Greeks. Edom is the Romans, which, which, which is what, which is who today? Which nation of people comes out of the Greeks and the Romans, the Europeans? the Caucasian race. So Esau, Edom, Idumia is the Caucasian race of today. All the Caucasians on this planet Earth, their biblical name is Esau, Edom, Idumia, Mount Seir. The Lord uses different metaphors for them because they, were, they are culture vultures. They have no apparent culture of themselves, of their own. So they, what? they steal other people's cultures and their names and their lands and may they make it their own. Just like the group of white people that was put in our land by the British government in 1948 called themselves Jewish Amalek in the Bible. Yes, today they call themselves, they say they are Jews, but they are not the real Jews. So they are culture vultures, okay? So now let's go back. Go back to Ezekiel 35, verse 3 again. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 3. Read. And say unto it, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, mm -hmm. O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. You see what the Lord says, he's going to make Esau, Edom, Idumia, Europe, the Europeans, the, the Caucasians, they call themselves Caucasian, Euro, German Caucasians, you understand, European Caucasians, American Caucasians, Russian Caucasians, Jewish Caucasians. They are all Esau, Edom, Idumia. And this, the law says, he's going to make the most desolate. So, because right now they are ruling the earth. The law says he's going to destroy this race. You understand? So all the evils that they're doing on this earth, they are going to pay for everything that they've done. All the evils that they perpetuated against the 12 tribes of Israel, they all going to pay. You understand? That's God's judgment right there. You understand? Now watch this. Now read verse 4. Come on. Ezekiel chapter 35 verse 4. Great. I will lay thy cities waste, mm -hmm. and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. You see what the Lord is saying? The Lord says he's going to destroy this, going to destroy their cities. You understand? He will make them most desolate. Because remember, the most High God did destroy their cities back then during the time of what? During the time of the Dark Ages. You understand when Rome was destroyed, but they came back into power and they rebuilt their desolate places. The Lord says he's going to destroy them again. And this time is going to be forever. They will never rise up again. Let's prove that. Give me that in Malachi 1 and 1. The book of Malachi chapter 1 verse 1. Let's read that. Malachi chapter 1 verse 1. Go ahead. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Come on. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet he say, wherein hast thou loved us? 
was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord. Yet I love Jacob. You see that thing? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Esau is Edom, Idumia, Mount Seir, that we're reading about in the book of Ezekiel. You understand? So Esau is Jacob's brother. He's the son of our forefather Isaac. Go ahead. And I hated Esau. God and says, the Lord says he, hold on. The Lord says he loves Jacob. You understand? Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Give me that in Exodus 1 and 1. Okay. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Watch this. Exodus 1 and 1. Let's see the sons of our forefather Jacob. Okay, read them. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Go ahead. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Great. Reuben, Simeon. The seminar, Reuben, the Seminole Indian, the so-called Seminole Indians of today. Go ahead. Simeon. Go ahead. Levi and Judah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin. Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. Wait. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So what we're reading here, we're reading about our forefathers. You understand? The sons and daughters of Jacob. The sons of Jacob. Okay? We're reading about our forefathers here. So Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel that we're reading about here in Exodus. You understand? And Jacob was a black man. So was our grandfather Isaac. So was a great grandfather Abraham. Those were all, these were, these are all black men. You understand? Get that in Genesis 2, verse 7. Because our forefather is that our history begins with our forefather Adam. Okay, watch this. Genesis 2, verse 7. Come on. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Great. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground mm -hmm. and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So now this is describing the first man, Adam, that was created. He says the Lord created him from the dust of the ground. Because we're hearing some foolishness on TikTok, foolishness on YouTube and Instagram. Talk about no, but you know, there's, there's white soil, there's red soil. Shut the hell up. Our people will always want to defend the slave master by any means. You understand? White supremacy. Our people, they don't want to be elevated and they don't want to be taught how great they are. They always have to bring, they always have to go against what's written in the Bible because they don't believe it, they don't understand it. They don't want to humble themselves down to this book. This book is the book of our fathers. So it says, the most high God, he made men from the dust of the ground. When you look at the dust of the ground, it's different shades of brown. The deeper you dig in the soil, the darker it becomes. So what was Adam? Adam was a black man. Understand that thing? Because this foolishness that we're hearing, they saw on as white sand. So what are you saying? He didn't say sand here, it says dust. He didn't say sand, it says dust. You understand? Now let me prove, let me prove that thing. That is not talking about any type of any type of uh, no white sand, red sand. No, no, no. It says dust of the ground. Let's prove that. Give me Jeremiah 14, verse 2. I'm gonna show you something here with this verse. We read it all the time, but watch this. Jeremiah 14, verse 2. You understand? Because me, I cannot stand dumb, wicked Negroes, clueless Negroes. Read what you got. Jeremiah 14, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 2. Go ahead. Judah morning. Mm -hmm. And the gates thereof languish. So Judah is talking about the tribe of Judah. Judah mourns and the gates thereof languish. Meaning what? We have where we, there's lack of leadership in the black community. That's why the Lord is raising up the prophets in these last days. Go ahead. They are black unto the ground. Stop right there. They are black unto the ground, just like Adam. Adam was created from the dust of the ground. What color was the dust of the ground? What did the color say? Read again. They are black unto the ground. You see what color was the ground? The ground, the dust of the ground, just like Aram, is giving you the color of the dust of the ground. Black. 
So this thing that we're hearing saying, no, no, they, they, there's red soil, there's blue soil. Listen, that's some foolishness. That's just the mind of a Negro who is in a what, who's defending white supremacy. That's all that, that that's all that's saying. That's the mind of the black man that they support white supremacy. Okay. Now read again verse two. Come on. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 2. Wait. To the morning, mm -hmm. and the gates thereof languish. Come they on. are black unto the ground. They and the are cry black of unto the ground. They are black unto the ground. Just like Adam, he was created from the dust of the ground. What color is it? Black. That's what we're reading here. So go back to Genesis 2, verse 7. So now we're reading that our forefather Adam was a black man. So is the children of Israel black. That's what we just read. So those white devils in our land today calling themselves Jewish, those are not the real Jews. You understand? Those are identity thieves. You understand? They committed identity theft and they are sitting on stolen land. Understand that? Which was given to them by the British government under the, under the Balfour Declaration mandate in 1948. Okay? Read that. Genesis 2 verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Go ahead. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Read. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man uh -huh. became a living soul. So Adam is a black man. It's very plain and simple. You understand? To understand. So the children of Israel that come out of Adam, which are called the sons of God, give me that in Exodus 4 verse 22. The children of Israel, we are the direct descendants of Adam. You understand? Today we call Bantus. You understand? Negroes, Hispanics, Native American Indians, but we make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Now read what you got. Exodus 4 verse 22. Read that. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22. Go ahead. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel mm -hmm. is my son. Come on. Give it my firstborn. You see that? Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So we are the sons of God. Just like Aram is the son of God, we come directly from Aram. You understand? We come out of the loins of Adam. Understand that thing. So read again verse 22. I want this verse to sink in. Come on. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22. Read. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus mm -hmm. saith the Lord, Israel Ray. is my son, Come even on. my firstborn. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Give me First John 3 verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Because the most high God, he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for the 12 tribes of Israel. The so-called blacks, Bantus, Hispanics, and Native American Indians. We make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And we are the sons of the living God. We come directly out of the loins of Adam. Understand that. Read that. First John 3, verse 1. Okay, come on. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Read. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that mm -hmm. we should be called the sons of God. You see that thing? The manner of love that the Lord has bestowed upon us is that we are called the sons of God. And the sons of God are coming back. The Lord is reviving us in these last days. We remember who we are now, that we are not Negroes. We are not, we are not duckies, we are not kafirs, we are not baboons, like they call us. No, we are the sons of the living God. Right. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because the world it don't know us yet. The world don't know us yet because when you look at the news, when they talk about Jewish people, when they talk about Israel, black people don't come up. You see white people in our land calling themselves Jewish, but God calls them Amalek. God calls them the synagogue of Satan. Those are not the children of Israel. You understand? Read. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because mm. it knew him not. Because they don't know Christ. They don't know. That's why they deny the existence of Christ. These Jewish people, the reason why they deny the existence of Christ because Christ spoke against them in Revelation 2 verse 9. We're going to get that next. Read. Come on. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And now are we the Sahara? Is it beloved? Now are we that are now are we the sons of God, read? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. He said, it doesn't appear yet. 
it does not appear that we are the sons of God. But guess what? We are the sons of God and we are waking up. Go ahead. But we know that when mm -hmm. he shall appear, we when shall Christ be shall like appear, him. When the Lord shall appear, when the Lord shall appear, go ahead. We shall be like him. Mm -hmm. For we shall see him as he is. As a God. You understand? The son of God. We're going to see him as the son of God because we are, just like him, the sons of the living God. That's what he's saying right there. He says, when he shall appear, we shall be like unto him. Because Christ, when he, he said, I'm not going to meet you as a man, meaning he's what he's going to be. He's going to meet you as a, as a what? As a God on earth. And he's going to give us the same power to rule these nations with a rod of iron. Understand that. You understand? Get that in Revelation 2 verse 9. Because I did mention that Amalek, Jewish people in our land, you understand? Those thieves in our land that they stole our culture, our land, you understand? And our name too, that God put upon us. Here's what Christ said about them. Read that. Revelation 2 verse 9. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. Go ahead. I know thy works and tribulation mm -hmm. and Read. poverty. But thou art rich, mm. and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You see what the Lord is saying? This is Christ speaking. He says, you know, the blasphemy, meaning the lies of those, they, they, of those that say they are Jews and they are not. Which people themselves call themselves Jewish today, and the world knows that those are the so-called Jewish people, those are the Jewish people. Who, who's saying that? It's not the black man. It's white folks in our land calling themselves Jewish. Christ is just talking about them yet. But Christ says they are the synagogue of Satan. You see that thing? They are the synagogues of Satan. The house of Satan. Those are not the people of God. You understand? They are not the people of God. Because watch this. Give me Revelation 3 verse 9. I'm going to show you something here. Because... What we're reading here, it's showing you that it does not apply to them. Okay, read that. Come on. Revelation Meaning chapter what? 3. They are, not the, they, are, they are not the people. That's what I mean when I say it does not apply. To, they are not the people. Because the sons of the living God, the nations will bow down unto us. Watch this. Read that. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9. Come on. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say mm -hmm. they are Jews and are not, but Come on. lie. You see that thing? They say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. The blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and they are not. Read. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet uh -huh. and to know that I have loved thee. You see that thing? It says he's going to make them, you know, all the nations, including Jewish people in our land, which is just white people who stole our identity in our land. The Most High God says he's going to make them to come and worship before our feet. And they are going to know that the Lord loves us and not them. That's what the Bible is saying. And to showing you that is, listen, watch this. Give me Revelation 19 verse 10. Because he says he's going to make them, the people that say they are Jews and they are not, which is Jewish people, white people in our land today, the Lord says he's going to make them to worship before our feet. Letting you know that they don't want, they don't, they, their, their behavior in our land does not fulfill prophecy that says the most High God is what? He's going to deliver us from the, the lands of our captivity. And we are not supposed to be worshiping one another. You understand? But the Lord here is saying he's going to make them those people that call themselves Jewish, the Lord says he's going to make them to what? To worship before our feet. If they were the real Jews, the Lord will not command them to do that. Watch this. Revelation 19 verse 10. Read what you got. Okay. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. Go ahead. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Mm -hmm. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. Read. I am thy fellow servant and all thy, thy brethren. I am thy fellow servant. I am thy fellow servant. Come on. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship mm -hmm. God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
You see that part right there? So this is the this is now this the angel is telling John, say, listen, don't don't bow down to worship me. I am your fellow servant and of thy brethren. You understand? So this is the law that was given to the Israelites. So now, if they, the white people in our land calling themselves Jewish, if they are the real Jews, this law does not apply to them. Because the Lord is saying, those white men that call themselves Jewish, God says he's going to make them to worship before our feet. Letting you know, those are not the real Jews. You see that thing? Those are not the real Jews. That's what the Lord is telling us right there in the spirit. Okay, now watch this. Now let's go back. Let's go back to um give go back to Malachi. Okay. Go back to Malachi chapter one. Malachi one. Read verse two again. Malachi one verse two. Come on. Malachi chapter one verse two. Come on. I have loved you, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yet he say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet well, I love Jacob. Well, Yet I love Jacob. Who's Jacob? Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, which are the so-called Blacks, Bantus, Hispanics, Native American Indians. Amalek, you understand? Jewish people, they are not part of this list. You understand? They, right now, the reason why they are in our land today is because it's is still their time to rule and to be in our land, you understand, against the, the, the will of the Father. But their time of being in that land is coming to an end. And the Arabs too. Because the Arabs don't belong in that land. You understand? That land also don't belong to them. It belonged to us. Okay? Ray. And I hated Esau mm -hmm. and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. You see that thing? The law says he hates Esau. Esau, Erom, Idumia. You understand? Also known as Mount Seir. Today they call themselves Europeans. Today they call themselves Russians, Germans, Dutch. Brits, you understand? Spanish and so forth. Americans, yeah, that's them. The law says he hates them and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, what we're reading here, all this, give me the book of Job 30, verse 29. The law says he hates the Caucasian race and he's laid, laid, he's, he laid their mountains and their heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, give me Job 30, verse 29. Read what you got. Job chapter 30, verse 29. Come on. I am a brother to dragons. Read it again. Job chapter 30, verse 29. Mm -hmm. I am a brother to dragons. What did he say? I am a brother to dragons. 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 So dragons here is not making reference to actual beasts. It's talking about wicked men. Which man is that? The white man, Esau, Edom, Idumia, who call themselves Americans and Europeans today. Read that again, verse 29. Come on. Job chapter 30, verse 29. Read. I am a brother to dragons uh -huh. and a companion to owls. These are unclean nations. The main one is talking about, is talking about Esau, Edom, Idumia. That's why it says, I'm a brother to dragons. So go back to Malachi 1 verse 3 again. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3. Mm -hmm. And I hated Esau and mm -hmm. laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. You see that thing? He says what? He says he laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. This is the beginning of the Dark Ages. The Most High God, he destroyed them. You understand? During the Dark Ages when Rome fell. Now watch this. Let's see what color is this dragon. Because the Lord says, he says he hates Esau and he's laid his mountain in his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So what color is this dragon? Who is called Esau? He's also referred to as a dragon. Dragons. Give me that in uh, Revelation 12 verse 3. Let's get the color of the dragon. What is the color of this dragon that is being spoken of in Malachi 1? Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Read that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Come on. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And mm -hmm. behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, 
and seven Wait. crowns upon his head. You see that thing? So read, read again, verse 3 again. I'm sorry, read verse 3 again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Come and on. behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. So what we're reading here, we are seeing, we are reading about what? John the Revelator is prophesying about the same beast that we're reading about in Malachi 1. In Malachi 1, is not saying a beast. It's saying Esau. You understand? Who is that? Who was what? Who is the dragon of the wilderness? So what we're reading here says, is we are given the color of the dragon. It says, this great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Let's get the let's get the history of this great red dragon. You understand? Who is called Esau? We know is the white man, but let's get his origin. Give me that in Genesis twenty five verse twenty one. Genesis twenty five verse twenty one. Let's go back into the history. Let's see the history of this man when he was born. Okay, read that. Genesis twenty five twenty one. Genesis twenty five verse twenty one. Read. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. Mm -hmm. Because she was barren. Because she couldn't conceive, right? And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebecca, mm -hmm. his wife, conceived. Because after they prayed to the Lord, the Lord blessed them with their child. With, with, with his, the Lord blessed them with the child, right? And the children struggled together within her. So now she said, she's got twins. She's got, tw she's, got, she's got more than one child in her stomach because it's the, the children struggled together within her. Meaning these kids are fighting in her stomach. These kids are fighting in her womb. Go ahead. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Why is there war in my stomach if this be a blessing? Read. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. Mm -hmm. And two men of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Come on. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So the Lord now is explaining to our former mother, Rebecca, okay, what does this mean? It says, two nations are in thy womb, Rebecca, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Meaning what? You've got, you've got two boys which are going to be the father of two major nations on earth. The one, then they are going to be completely different. One people will be stronger than the other people, and the older one will serve the young. Go ahead. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, mm. there were twins in her womb. There were twins in her womb because these were not identical twins. These were fraternal twins because in verse 23 says, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Read. And the first came out red, mm -hmm. all over like a hairy garment. And they Wait. called his name Esau. You see that thing? The first boy came out red, which is the elder one, which is going to serve the young. Now they are giving you the color of this boy. He says, the first came out red all over like an hairy garment. They call his name Esau. Because today when you look at the so-called white people, because they are not white, they are red. You understand? They are not malinated people. You understand? Because you can see their blood through their veins. You can see their blood through their skin. They are, that's why the law says they are red and they are hairy. You understand? They've got a lot of hair. And they, he says they call his name Esau. Okay, go ahead. And after that came his brother out and his the head. Younger, right? After that came and, his brother out, which is the younger in verse 23, which will be what? Which be a ruler over the elder one. Go ahead. And his hand took hold on Esau's heel. Mm hmm and his name was called Jacob. And Wait. Isaac was three score years old when she bared him. You see that part right there? And his name was called Jacob. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. You understand? The blacks, the Bantus, Hispanics, Native American Indians. And Esau is the father of the Caucasians of today. The Americans, the Europeans, the Dutch, the British, the Portuguese, the Spaniards. You understand? That, that's the father of those people that I just mentioned today. Jump down to the stage. Let's see. You understand? Esau's name was changed. What Esau's name was changed to Edom. Let's get that. Read the stage now. 
Come on. Genesis chapter 25, verse 30. Mm -hmm. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Mm -hmm. Therefore was his name called Edom. Therefore was his name called Edom. So Esau's name was changed to Edom. You understand? Which means red. Edom means red. Esau means wasted away is he because why? He does not have melanin in his skin. His melanin is wasted. You see that thing? So he's got what? Leprosy. He's a clean leper. So now, what we're reading here, we get in the history of the white man, the Caucasian race. That is why I'm bringing this out like this because our people don't know this. You understand? So never take this information for granted because our people do not know. Now watch this. Let's go back to Revelation 12 verse 3. Let's go back there. Revelation 12 verse 3. Now we get in the origin of the white man. The origin of the so-called white man because he's not white. He's red according to the Bible. That's why his name was changed from Esau to Edom to mean red. Okay? Revelation 12 verse 3. Read that again. Revelation chapter 12 verse 3. Go ahead. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And mm -hmm. behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven Come crowns on. upon his heads. You see that thing? It says, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Another wonder in heaven. The heaven here is not talking about the sky. It's talking about rulership. There appeared another wonder in rulership. Who's this wonder? This great red dragon that has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Because these crowns represent what? rulership of empires on earth. So now, this wonder that appeared in heaven, when did it start? When did this wonder start to rule nations on earth? Give me that in First Maccabees 1 and 1. He says, they appear another wonder in heaven. Now we discover that this great red, red dragon is a metaphor for Esau. What we read in Ezekiel 35, verse 2 and 3, guess what? We read that the Lord is referring to Esau as Mount Seir. That's another metaphor for him. Why? Because they took over the land of Seir. They kicked the Horims out. Right here we're reading, there is a great red dragon. Where is that coming from? The, how he was born. How he looks. His color. His red. That's why it's called the great red dragon. It's a metaphor for the white man. Now, let's go to First Maccabees 1 and 1. You understand? Let's see, let's see when this great wonder appeared in heaven. Okay? Read that. First Maccabees 1 and 1. Come on. First Maccabees chapter 1 verse 1. Read. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, mm -hmm. Come on. Who came out of the land of Kittim, That's wrong. Had, smitten, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, mm -hmm. that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. You see that thing? That's when the first, that when the wonder appeared in heaven. That's, when the, that's the first time when this great wonder appeared in heaven, which is called the Great Red Dragon. What was his name? Alexander, the so-called Great. Alexander the Greek. He took over the kingdom of the Greeks around 333 BC. You understand? That was the first time when this great wonder appeared in heaven. Read again verse 1. Come on. First Maccabees chapter 1 verse 1. Go ahead. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, mm -hmm. who came out of the land of Kittim, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned instead the first over Greece. Because when Alexander took over, when Alexander came into power, he took over the kingdom of the Persians and the Medes. He took over the Persian Empire. You understand? And then he took the throne of Greece around 333 BC. That's when this first, this wonder this, but that's when the first time when this great wonder appeared in heaven. You understand? The second time when it appeared, the first time, then after that, that's when he started to what he started to have more than one crown upon his head because he was being one. He was conquering, he was destroying nations, starting with the Persians and the Greek, the Persians and the Medes. Watch this. Give me the book of First Maccabees 8 and 1. Okay. I'm just gonna touch on. The first two heads of the crowns of this great wonder that appeared in heaven. The first two crowns. Read that. First Maccabees 8 verse 1. Come on. 
First Maccabees chapter 8, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Now Judas had heard of the fame of the Romans, that they were mighty and valiant men, right. and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them, mm -hmm. and make a league of enmity with all that came unto them. So now, at this point, this is now Rome is coming into power. You understand? Rome is coming into power. You understand? And because Rome is coming into power, guess what? When the Romans took over, they swallowed the Greeks. They became the Greco-Roman Empire. That's what is called and referred to in history. The Greco-Roman Empire. You understand? Read that again. Verse 1. First Maccabees chapter 8, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Now Judas had heard of the fame of the Romans, that yeah. they were mighty and valiant men, and mm -hmm. such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them, yeah. and make speak of enmity with all that came unto them. So when Rome was taking over, you understand, it's not that Rome didn't exist, but when it now it was his time to swallow the Greeks, that's what is going into here. That was this time of Rome swallowing the Greeks when Rome was now going to become the superpower of the earth during that time. He says they accepted all those that joined themselves unto them. Those that made friendships with them, Rome accepted them. That's the same thing that America does today. If you are, you are, you are an allied country with America, they look after you, they take care of you, but at a very high cost because they will get resources of, of your land and what? in exchange for what protection in exchange for being friends with you you see that thing so america is an extension of ancient rome you understand so when did they take when did they fully become empowered watch this i'm gonna share i'm gonna share my screen bro. hold on a second let me share my screen so you can see okay pay close attention now read that the roman republic it started with the Roman Republic in 509 BC. Now read that. Reading from wikipedia.org, mm -hmm. Roman Republic. The Roman Republic was a state of the classical Roman civilization, right. ran through public representation of the Roman people. Mm -hmm. White people, right? Beginning with the overthrow of the Roman kingdom, traditionally dated to 509 BC and ending mm -hmm. in 27 BC with the establishment of the Roman Empire. Rome the, so the Roman Empire, hold on, pay attention now. The Roman Empire was established in 27 BC. So guess what? The Roman Republic is from 509 BC and ending in 27 BC, which was the beginning of the Roman Empire. Go ahead. Rome's control rapidly expanded during this period from the city's immediate surroundings to, hege to hegemony over the entire Mediterranean world. Mediterranean world. So Roman Republic, you understand? That's what we're reading about here in First Maccabees 8 and 1, to all the way out throughout what? 27 BC, which is the beginning of the Roman Empire. So it moved from a republic to an empire. You see that thing right there? Now watch this. Let's go to, um, hmm. no, I don't want that yet. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Let me see. Yes, yes. Give me the book of Revelation 13 verse 12 because the Roman empire started to take force in 27 BC. You understand? They started to take power in 27 BC. So make sure you write these, these approximate dates down. Write them down, okay? Now give me Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Now we want to find out the fall of Rome. When did Rome fall? When did it fall? Let's read that. Revelation 13, verse 12. Read that. Come on. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Read. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him mm -hmm. and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Yes, you see what he's saying? It says the America, because this is talking about Babylon the Great, which is called the United States of America. 
You understand? It says, America exercises the power of the first beast. What was the first beast? He's talking about Rome. You understand? It says, whose deadly wound was healed. Because when was Rome wounded? Because remember, America is an extension of ancient Rome. So here it says, whose deadly wound was healed. So when was Rome, when was Rome wounded? Jump down to verse 14. Let's see what the Bible says about this thing. Come on. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. Read. And deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So the miracles is going into um, the nuclear bombs, the atomic bombs that they drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They said, no, it was what? It was like fire came down from heaven. They said, God bless America. That's what they did. And that's what they said. That was the miracle, the atomic bomb. Go ahead. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should mm -hmm. make an image to the beast. You see that thing? With that they should make an image to the beast, right? Which had the wound by a sword and did live. You see that thing? So this image of the beast is talk about the white image of Jesus, Caesar Bourget. You understand? The image that was painted in the 1400s by Leonardo da Vinci and later on by Michelangelo and various other artists that came after them. But the main one that started to paint the Pope, the, the second son, the, the Pope, the Pope's son, Rodrigo de Borges, you understand, who's also called Pope Alexander, was Leonardo da Vinci. So what we read in here when it says they made the image of the beast, you understand that the image of the beast should both live, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So when did this beast, when was it wounded? Because the Lord is telling us this, John the Revelator is prophesying when he says Rome was going to be wounded. You understand? Because during this time, it was during the time of Rome. Rome was still ruling during this time during the time when John the Revelator prophesied, you understand, on the island of Patmos. So now watch this. Let's go to Britannica.com. I want you to read that, the early Roman Empire. Reading from Britannica.com, the mm -hmm. early Roman Empire, did 1 yes. BC to 193 AD. You see that thing to 8193. So what we're reading here, they are giving you approximate dates when the Roman Empire came into, into existence. You understand? Because they destroyed the Roman Republic. Then they became the Roman Empire. So some say 27 BC, some say 31 BC. These are just approximates. Okay? But let's read that. Read that. The consolidation of the empire under the Julio Claudians. Julio Claudians. The establishment. Okay, that goes into Claudius Caesar and Caesar Augustus. Go ahead. The establishment of the Principate under Augustus. Read. Actium left Octavian the master of the Roman world. This supremacy successfully maintained until his death more than 40 years later made him the first of the Roman emperors. Suicide removed Anthony and Cleopatra and their potential menace in 30 BC, and the mm -hmm. annexation of e Egypt with its Ptolemaic treasure brought financial independence. With these reassurances, Octavian could begin the task of reconstruction. So now is the reconstruction period, right? This is the time of the emperors now. I want you to read these Roman emperors. Okay, we're gonna read down. So you're gonna read on the left, and the time that they ruled, okay, start, come on. Roman emperors, Augustus, Augustus Caesar, 27 BC to, to 14 AD. Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, 14 to 37. 14 to 37 AD, so this is Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, okay, come on. Cali Caligula. Caligula. Gaius. Caligula. 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 Gaius Caesar Germanicus. Okay, come on. Caligula. Gaius Caesar Germanicus. 37 mm -hmm. to 41 AD. 
Go ahead. Tiberius, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, 41 to 54 AD. Nero. Mm -hmm. Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, 54 to 68 AD. So Gal during the time of Nero, that, that during the time of Nero, that's when they were what, they were hunting down the apostles and killing them. And Nero bent down. Um, he bent down one of the buildings and he blamed it on the apostles. You understand? And when he did that, they started to hunt down the apostles, those that were teaching the true gospel of Christ. Nero was responsible for that thing. He bent down buildings and he blamed it on us. Read. Galba. Savius Galba Caesar Augustus, 68 to 69 AD. Also, Marcus also Caesar Augustus, 69 AD. Vitellius, mm -hmm. Aulus Vitellius, 69 AD. Vespasian, Caesar Vesp Vespasianus Augustus, 69 to 79 AD. Stop right there. You see, you've got Vespasian, Okay, you're gonna read about Tyrus next. Okay, you've got Vespasian, okay, and his son Tyrus. Go ahead. Tyrus. Tyrus Vespanius Augustus, 79 to 81 AD. Go ahead. Domitian, Caesar Domin Dominicius Augustus, 81 to 96 AD. So Never. Emperor Domitian, you got. Emperor Domitian, okay, that's a history for another time. But you can read about that um, in when you read Revelation 2, verse 9, okay, Revelation 1, 1, uh, Revelation 1, you can read about the history of the Emperor Domitian. Okay, read. Never, never Caesar Augustus, 96 to 98 AD. Go ahead. Trajan, Caesar Divinave. Phileas Never, Trianus, Optimus Augustus, 98 to 117 AD. Mm -hmm. Hadrian, Caesar Trianus, Hadrianus Augustus, 117 to 138 AD. Go ahead. Antonius Pius, Caesar Titus, Elias, Hadrianus, Antonius Augustus Pius, 138. Eight to 161 AD. Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. You can, you can, you want to get some more details, you can read about him. But when he watched the movie Gladiator, that's during his time. Marcus Aurelius. Go ahead. Marcus Aurelius. Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antonius Augustus, 161 to 180 AD. Mm -hmm. Lucius Verus. Lucius Aurelius Verus, 161 to 169 AD. Mm -hmm. Commodus, Caesar Marcus Aurelius Commodus Antonius Augustus, 177 to 192 AD. So Commodus, so Commodus is, is what? He's also coming out of that lineage of Marcus Aurelius. Okay, Commodus, go ahead. Pertinex, Publius Helvius Pertinex. 193 AD. Now watch this. I want you to pay close attention here. Okay, go ahead. Didius Severus Julianus. Marcus Didius Severus Julianus. 193 AD. Now watch this. Next one. Come on. Septimius Severus. Lucius mm -hmm. Septimius Severus Pertinus. 193 to 211 AD. So now at this point, that's when Rome fell in 193 AD. Septimius Severus, Lucius Septimius Severus Pertinax. This was a black man right here. He's the one that brought, that is the one that wounded. You understand? He wounded the dragon. He wounded the beast with a sword. Okay, now let's click that. Obviously, they want to, you know, they will obviously they'll show you a white man, which is crazy. Okay, read that. Septimius Severius. Septimius Severius. 
in full Lucius Septimius Severius Pertinus, born April 11th, 145 or 146. Leptemius Magna, Tripolin, Tripolitania, now in Libya, died so, oh, February. Oh, oh, oh. Don't, no, don't rush that. Come on, pay attention. It says, Septimius Severus in full, Lysias, Septimius Severus Portinex, born April 11, 145, 146. Okay, B, uh, AD. Lept, Leptis Magna, Tripolitania, now in Libya. You see where he was born? In Libya. This was a black man. He's not talking about, this is not a white man, but they're putting a bust of a white man here. Septemius was born in Libya. That's North Africa. You understand? That is North Africa. Go ahead. Tripoli, Tripolitania, now in Libya, died February 4th to 11. Mm -hmm. Eporecum, Britain, now York, England. Roman emperor from 193 to 211. You see that? He thing? found So he what, hold on. What we reading here, what we reading here, we reading a little snippet of history of Septimia Severus. He was a black man. Okay, keep reading. Go ahead. He founded a personal dynasty and converted the government into a military monarchy. You see that thing? So during this time, he converted the Roman empire into a military monarchy. You understand? An army of soldiers. That's when, when Rome was over, overcame and overthrown. He's the one that did it. Okay, go ahead. His reign marks a critical stage in the development of the absolute despotism that characterized the later Roman Empire. You see that thing? It says his reign marks a critical stage in the development of the absolute despotism that characterized the later Roman Empire. That means what the end of the Roman Empire in terms of what under Esau, Edom, Idumia. They took over the gladiators. He was one of the gladiators. You understand? They turned Rome into a what? They turned Rome into a military monarchy. Okay. So that was the beginning of what the Dark Ages. I'm going to prove that. Watch this. Now let's go to the period 193 AD. I want you to read that. Wikipedia.org, mm -hmm. year 193, was a common year starting on Monday really? of, the, of the Julian calendar mm -hmm. at the time. It was known as the year of the consulship of Socius and Eritius, or less frequently, year 946. Okay, that's, Ab, that, 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 when you say year 946, Ab Ube that just goes into a different calendar, how they number the years and so forth, but it's 193.80, so don't get caught up on that. Keep reading. The denomination 193 for this year has been used since the early medieval period. Stop right there. It says the denomination 193 for this year has been used since the early medieval period. What is that? What is the medieval period? The early medieval period is letting you know this was the beginning of the Dark Ages. Medieval period. You understand? The Dark Ages, the Middle Ages period. The early, that is when the early medieval period started. You understand? Go ahead. When the Anno Domini calendar era be became the prevalent method in Europe for naming years. You see, it says when Anno Domini, that's AD, Anno Domini meaning after death, after Christ, the calendar era became the prevalent method in Europe for naming years because they use Christ. He was such an important figure on this earth that they are using time. They're calculating time based on his birth, his death, his resurrection, and when he went back to the Father. The number of the years, they are based on that man, this man's existence, the black Messiah, BC, AD. You see that thing? So what we're reading here is letting you know 193 AD was the beginning of the dark ages. Okay? That's what we read in there. Now watch this. Let's go back to the scriptures now. Now give me wisdom of Solomon 7 verse 17. You know what? Go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13 verse 14 again. Let's read that again. 
so we don't lose the thought. Okay, come on. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. He says, this, this beast had a wound by a sword. That's 193 AD, Septimia Severus, okay? It says, and did live, meaning this beast came back during the Renaissance in 1453, during the Renaissance. So what I'm showing you here, I'm showing you history. I'm taking you back when this beast fell, when it rose, you understand? The great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns. I'm showing you the first two heads of the dragon before it fell and came back again during the Renaissance. You understand? So during the time when it came up, during the time of Alexander, the Greeks, 33 BC, and with the Roman Republic, 509 to, 20, to 27 BC, from 27 all the way to 193 AD at the, at the hands of Septimius Severus, which was the beginning of the Dark Ages. And King Solomon saw the Dark Ages. Get that? In Wisdom of Solomon now, 7 verse 17. Okay, let's read that. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7. Verse 17. Come on. For he had given me certain knowledge of the things that are, namely, to know how the world was made and the operation of the elements. So the Lord, King Solomon is professing the, the, the wisdom that the Lord bestowed upon him. You understand? To know the things that are, namely, to know how the world was made, meaning Genesis, and the operation of the elements, how it was put together. Go ahead. The beginning and, uh -huh. and midst of the times. So now King Solomon is declaring to us, he says, the Lord showed him the beginning of times, how the world was made in verse 17, the ending, meaning the end of times. King Solomon saw the return of the black Messiah, okay? And the midst of the times, meaning the Middle Ages, the medieval period, which started in 193 AD, by the hand of Septimia Severus when Rome fell, which was the beginning of the period called the Dark Ages. King Solomon saw that thing. He saw the beginning of time. He saw the middle of time. He saw the end of time. So right now we are focusing on the middle of time, the Dark Ages as it's called in the history. Give me Job 30 verse five. Let's get some details on the Dark Ages. What happened during the Dark Ages? When, when, when Rome fell in 193 AD by the hands of our forefather, Septimius Severus, what happened? This is what took place. Now read what you got. Job 30 verse 5. Come on. Job chapter 30 verse 5. Mm -hmm. They were driven forth from among men. Come they on. cried after them as after a thief. So when we destroyed, when Rome fell in 193 AD, it says the Caucasians he says, they were driven forth from among men. We kicked them out and we drove them off from among men, from dwelling among men. They cried after them as after a thief. Where did we drive them to? Go ahead. To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, mm -hmm. in caves of the earth and in the rocks. The Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. That's why they call themselves Caucasians because that's where they were dwelling. That's where we push them to. We push them there. So our forefather Job is giving us the history of when we push the white people, so-called white people, Caucasian race, do you understand? To the, to, to the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Go ahead, which is also called what? When, when they were over there, there was no resources over there. And when they were put, when they were in Europe also, there, there's no resources there. That's why it's called the bottomless pit. Go ahead. Among the bushes they braid, and mm -hmm. the nettles they were gathered together. You see that thing under the bushes they braid. So they were what? They were living under trees and eating roots and juniper ju juniper leaves and so forth. We all that's what they were. They was feeding on. There was no razor blade. None of that stuff that they are doing today, following the examples of Alexander. Go ahead. They were children of fools. Yay. Mm -hmm. Children of base men. He said they, they were, were children of fools. 
They are children of fools. You understand? They are dumb as hell, the Lord is saying. There is no cause. The Lord is telling you their nature. So you have to ask yourself, well, how did this white man manage to come back into power, okay? And, and, and rebuild, you understand? The greatest empires known, you understand, in, the, in these last days in the known world and managed to make such technological advances where he's traveling to space. He's going to the moon. He landed on Mars. How did he get this knowledge when the Lord is letting you know and says, these are children of fools. How did this white man manage to put a, a man on the moon? How did he manage to build, to put the space station, you understand, up there in the heavens? How did he manage to do that? Where did he get this great knowledge from? When the Lord is telling you that these were, they were children of fools, yea, children of base men, meaning the lowest of the lowest of men. And they, are, it says they were viler than the earth. They are the worst kind of creation on this earth. They are worse than anything on this earth. So how did they manage to ascend up to the heavens? How did they manage to have such technological advances, which is witchcraft? How did they manage to do that? Because they worship the devil. That's how. It's not because they are so clever. Mm -mm. They worship the devil. Okay, go ahead. They were viler than the earth. Mm -hmm. And now am I their soul? Yea, I yeah, am I'm... their... I am their byway, meaning what? Now they've conquered us, they disrespect us, they understand, they speak evil of us, they teach their children to do the same. We see it at our jobs, we see it at the malls, we see it everywhere we go. Okay, go ahead. Yea, I am their byway. Mm -hmm. They are born, they, they flee. They flee far from me. They and don't spare want to not. associate with us. During apartheid, do you remember during apartheid when they say blacks only, whites only, Africans here only, Africans toilets here and so forth? That's what we're reading. It says they are bombing. They hate us. They flee far from us. They don't want to be associated with us because they say, no, you are swart men. Say, here and blacks here. Go ahead. They flee far from me and mm -hmm. spare not to spit in my face. They disrespect us. That's why they, they, they spend not to spit in my face. Meaning what? They disrespect us. They are byways because they call us kafirs. They call us baboons. You understand? Swart men says all kind of evil names that they call us. You understand? So because why? Now we are at the bottom. They are on top. Because of what? Because we broke God's laws. But we are coming back. The Lord is reviving us and they know it. That's why they have no plans even to go back to the office. Because the white man knows what's coming. They know that the end of the world is at hand. Why do you think they are prepping? When you look, when you watch movies, right, you notice that when there's a disaster that affects the earth, you see that movie, Independence Day. The president told the people, say, listen, everybody remain in your houses. We don't want everybody to panic. You understand? Everybody remain calm, stay in your houses and so forth. That's what they are doing now. Don't get it twisted. So don't sleep, brothers. Don't sleep. Okay? Now, Let's go back. Uh, you know what? Give me Isaiah 2 verse 19. You understand? Isaiah 2 verse 19. Because for them to end up in, in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia, we are the ones that put them over there. We are the one that put them over there. We separated them from the, 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 the people that the Lord created on this earth. Because they deserve to stay there. Okay? Isaiah 2 verse 19. Read what you got. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 19. Go ahead. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks mm -hmm. and into the caves of the earth for fear yeah. of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. So you see what happened is that they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. So where did they go? They went to the Caucasus mountains of Georgia, Russia, but they didn't walk. They didn't go willingly. We chased them as though we are chasing after a thief. Like they stole something. That's how we chased them. Yes, that's how they ended up over there. Now, let's go back. Go back to Malachi now. Malachi chapter 1, verse 3 again. Because that's where we was. Let's go back there. I'm taking you through history here. Pay attention. You must write, write, these, write these things down. Note these timelines down because I'm going to ask you about these things. Read them. 
Malachi 1 verse 3. Come on. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3. Mm -hmm. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. You see that thing for the dragons of the wilderness, meaning we chased them to the wilderness. What wilderness was this? The Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Next verse. Go ahead. Wales Edom saith, mm -hmm. we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith really? the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So now it says, you know what, read the verse again, read it again for me, so we can dig into this thing. Go ahead. Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. Mm -hmm. Where's Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Stop right there. So Edom says, which is the Caucasian race, so-called white people, it says, they said we are impoverished. So when, did, when were they impoverished? During the dark ages in verse 3. That's when they were impoverished because we pushed them to the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Okay, that's why they are saying we are impoverished. That's when they impoverished during the dark ages. Okay, go ahead. But we will return and build the desolate places. But they are saying they will return and build the desolate places. When did they return to build the desolate places? 1453 during the Renaissance. Okay, go back to Revelation chapter 13. Read verse 14 again. Okay. It says, but we will return and build the desolate places. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those you know miracles. What? You know what? Read verse 12 again. Read verse 12 again. You're going to read 12 and 14 together. Okay, come on. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Mm -hmm. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Whose deadly wound was, was healed. That's when he came back into power during the Renaissance, 1453. I'm going to show you something with this. Go ahead. Read verse 14. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. The devil, read. Saying to them, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. He says, this image of the beast is the white image of Jesus, Caesar Borges, the image of the beast, the image of the devil. He says, which had the wound by a sword. So this empire had a wound by a sword. When did it take place? 193 AD. It says, and did live, and did live. When did he come back into power? 1453 during the Renaissance. Revelation chapter 13, uh, read verse 7. Revelation 13 and verse 7. You know what? Jump up to verse 3. Watch this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded you know to death. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. You know what? Hmm. Read Revelation 13, verse 1. I'm going to, let's read that real fast. I, I just want to get to some. I'm going to show you how this, this beast, because it says it was wounded to death which is during the dark ages. And he says, and did live. This is when it came back. Revelation 13 verse one, read that. Revelation chapter 13 verse one. Go ahead. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and mm -hmm. saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having Wait. seven heads and 10 horns. And upon his horns, 10 crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. You see that thing? So now John the Revelator is seeing um, this beast that is rising up out of the sea. Meaning what? There's deadly wound that was the deadly wound that was the, the deadly wound that was healed. This is when it came back. This beast is rising up out of the sea. Meaning what? It's coming back into power. When it came back into power, it says what? Seven heads and ten horns. Remember, the first two heads of the dragon, you understand, came up. 
And then the second head of the dragon was destroyed, which was the beginning of the dark ages. Now the third head of the dragon will come up, you understand, in 1453 during the Renaissance. So that's what this history is going into, which is the prophecy. Go ahead. Having seven heads and ten horns, and mm. upon his horns, ten crowns. Great. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. The ten crowns going into the European nations, the EU. That's the ten crowns. That's the ten crowns. The seven heads is Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, uh, Germany, uh, well, Great Britain. Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, Great Britain. And out of that came America, which is the extension of ancient Rome, the empire that was destroyed with the sword and did he and did live. We're reading about it, them coming back into power here. Go ahead. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. He said, and his this feet. Beast, hold on. He says, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Remember, what is the color of the beast? What is the color of the dragon? It's red. So he says, this beast was like unto a leopard. When you read Daniel 7, it talks about what? The empires that Daniel saw. One of which is had the symbol of the leopard, which was the Greeks. The Greeks is letting you know that the Greeks is part of this dragon. Go ahead. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. So now one of the empires that our forefather Daniel saw was that his feet was the feet of a bear, which represents the Persian empire. You understand? The feet of a bear. But guess what? This dragon is red. You understand? So he's got the attribute of those ancient kingdom, kingdoms. You understand? Which is what? The bear. The bear goes into what? The Persians. Because the Persians had what? Had a dual kingdom, the Persians and the Medes. That's why America has republicanism, you understand, and democratic system. Democrats and republicanism, that's the same thing. They took it from the Persian empire. Go ahead. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion. So now it says this, the mouth of this beast is got the mouth of the, like the mouth of a lion. Now, when you read them ancient empires in Daniel 7, you read about the lion, which is what the Babylonians. But the Babylonians were not red people. They were, they were dark-skinned race, which is the ancient Kushites. But they took the attributes of those ancient kingdoms. Babylon, the great. You understand? So now, today, who took the symbol of the lion? Great Britain. Go ahead. And the dragon gave him his power and mm -hmm. his feet and great authority. You see that part right there? As, as, and the dragon gave him his power. So the dragon here is talking about who? The dragon here is talking about the spiritual demon Satan. It says the dragon gave him his power. The dragon gave this white man, this beast that has seven heads and ten horns, power. Give me Luke 4 verse 4. Let's see how this, this, this dragon that rose up, you understand, that John the Revelator is seeing. Let's see how he received power, okay? to conquer, to, to have these technological advances that he's making. How did he get the power to do it? Get that in Luke 4, verse 4. Let's get there. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Go ahead. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Okay, start of verse 3. We're going to read down. Luke 4, verse 3. We're going to read down. Luke chapter 4, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. He says, if the devil now is having a discussion with our, with, with our Lord and Savior, the Christ. Go ahead. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Come on. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So now the devil is showing Christ all the kingdoms of the earth, starting with what? The kingdoms, the empires that you are seeing today, America, Europe, China, India, Saudi Arabia, and so on, all the kingdoms that are ruling this earth. Read. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the mm -hmm. glory of them. 
for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. You see what you see what the devil is saying? Is that the devil said unto him, All this power, all this power will I give thee. Will I give thee and the glory of them, meaning the riches of the empires of the kingdoms that are ruling? I'm gonna give that to you. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. So hold this, give me Job 9. Give me, give me the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 24. Job 9, verse 24. Watch this. Job, chapter 9, verse 24. Come on. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? So you see what the forefather Job is saying? is that the earth is given. The earth is given. Given into the hand of the wicked. You understand? He covered the faces of the judges thereof. They changed all our pictures in the Bible, our imagery. You understand? Even during the time when we ruled, they've been whitewashing the process called iconoclasm. It says there, thereof. It says, if not, where and who is it? If who's ruling the earth right now? The white man. If it's not him, who is doing it? Nobody. Because the earth is given unto him. Where did we just read that? Go back to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. It says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. And when the wicked took over, he covered the faces of the judges. Who's the judges of the earth? The 12 tribes of Israel. They stole our identity, our culture our names, our images, you understand? And our book too. Okay, Luke 4 verse 6, come on. Luke chapter 4 verse 6. Go ahead. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee. You see that part? And the all this power will I give thee. Remember it says the earth is given into the hand of the wicked, the white man. Go ahead. And the glory of them the riches of them, read. For that is delivered unto me, and mm. to whomsoever I will, I give it. Because, keep reading, read on. If thou therefore will worship me, mm -hmm. all shall be thine. You see that thing? If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. So what did the white man do in order for him to get the power he's got today in the earth, the riches he's got, the control of the whole earth, who gave him the power? The devil. The devil gave him the power that is God. You understand? It's not because he's clever. No, it's because he worships the devil. Now let's go back to Revelation 13, verse 2 again. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. Go ahead. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, mm -hmm. and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and Wait. his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Come on. And the dragon gave him his power and his uh -huh. seat and right. great authority. You see that thing? The dragon is the spiritual demon Satan. The spiritual demon Satan gave the white man the, his power he, and his seat and great authority. So the power that the white man has today, whether it be to build weapons, technological advancements and all of that, touch screens, you understand? Tablets and all that with Steve Jobs. Those men are not geniuses. They worship the devil. You understand? Who Mark Zuckerberg and all, they worship the devil. That's what the Bible is saying here. It says what the, the spiritual demon Satan gave them, the power that they've got today, you understand? And the, and the seat, because they are sitting on top of all nations. You understand? America is the greatest kingdom on earth and great authority. The authority that this white man has is because he worships the devil. That's how the, the, the wound was healed. How? Because they took the devil's offer and the devil gladly gave them the power and the riches of the earth. You see that thing? That's what we're reading here. Keep reading, verse 3. Go ahead. And I saw one of his heads as it was mm -hmm. wounded to death. Go ahead. And his deadly wound was healed. That's 1453. His deadly wound was healed. 
That's when they came back into power in the earth during the Renaissance. Go ahead. And all the world wondered after the beast. And everybody's wondering after this man. Everybody wants to be the, the to be this man. Everybody wants to be with this man. You see that thing? That's what we're reading here. They want to be him. They want to be with him. They support him. Even when he's doing evil, they just support him. Because why? Everybody's wondering. You understand? They created the atomic bomb. They say, God bless America. Hmm? Because when they came into power, what did they do? They destroyed the city of Constantinople, Byzantine, our, our city of Byzantine. You understand? Because the city of, of Byzantine today is modern day Istanbul. That was our city of Byzantine. That was conquered by Mehmed II. You understand? And Esau and Ishmael were all working together to destroy us and the city of Byzantium. So that's what we're reading here. And then from there, they took over Spain. That's when the Spanish Inquisition came into place, the Portuguese Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition. You understand? After what? The papal bull that was put together by who? Pope. Who put it together? Anybody remember? Hello? Who created the papal bull? Who created the damn diverses? Who did it? Come on, brothers. Pope Nicholas. Pope, Adam. Pope Nicholas V. Pope Nicholas V is the one that created the damn diverses. You understand? The papal bulls, the decree, the mandate to create what? To subject all black people into slavery, perpetual slavery. That's what that's the class we went over. You understand? So all of this, it ties in together. I need you men to pay attention. You must know this history. What we're going over here, this is Bible prophecy, which is also history that happens. You understand? So you need you must know it. You must know this thing. Okay. Now jump down to verse seven. Because when this man when, when this man took over, what did he do? When this white man took over. Here's what he did. Read verse 7 now. Watch this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. You see that thing? So then what was given to him to make war with the saints? The power, you understand? The seat and the great authority that was given to him by his father, the devil. And when he, had the, when he got that power, he says what? Read that verse again, verse 7. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Go ahead. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. It was given, power was given to him to make war with the saints. That's why they what? They, they, they kicked us out of our city, Byzantine, Constantinople. You understand? Rome, Spain, when we're ruling as the Moors, the Spanish, Portuguese, and Roman Inquisition. 1492, Christopher Columbus, by what? By who? Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. They were using the papal bull and the damn diversas that was put together by Pope Nicholas V. You see that thing? So everything we're reading here, it was to do what? Is to destroy the city of Byzantine. That's what we're reading right here. Okay, keep reading. Go ahead. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. You see that thing? So now what we're reading here says power was, it was what? It was given him to make war with the saints. Who's the saints? Who are the saints? Give me that in, um, give me that in Isaiah 45. Okay. Now I'm going to Psalms 148 verse 14. Give me that thing. So let's see who the saints are. He says it was power was given him to make war with the saints. Psalms 148 verse 14. Let's see who are the saints. Okay. Psalms chapter 148. Verse 14. Go ahead. He also exalted the horn of his people, mm -hmm. the praise of all his saints, Great. of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. You see that thing? The children of Israel are the only saints in the Bible. The saints is the 12 tribes of Israel scattered everywhere, scattered here in South Africa, here on the continent, in Europe, in China, in India. 
You understand? In America, North Central and South, via slave ships, okay, colonized, forced to migrate out of our homeland and to be in the lands of our captivity, which is where we are now. So power was given in to make war with the saints, the transatlantic slave trade, the sub-Sahara slave trade, the Silk Road slave trade, the Bantu migration, the Bantu forced migration from Guinea. And where were we coming from? Jerusalem in 70 AD, when Vespasian in its Tyrus destroyed the holy city of Jerusalem. So all of that goes into what they made war with us, starting with the city of Byzantine. From before that, 70 AD in Jerusalem. So it goes all the way back. You understand? So when they came into power, that's what they did. They made war with us. You understand? Watch this. Give me, um, give me Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Go ahead. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the mm -hmm. beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. You see that thing? It says, when they shall have finished their testimony, what was our testimony? Rulership during the what? During the Dark Ages, from 193 AD to what? To the 1600s, when we were ruling Europe, Russia, England, Scotland, and so forth. We ruled this. That's our testimony. It says, the beast that ascended out order of the bottomless pit. What is that beast? The white man came in, coming back into power during the Renaissance in 1453. That's what he's talking about here. The bottomless pit, the cliffs of the rocks that we read about in Job 30, verse 5, down through verse 10. Go ahead, read it again, verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the Wait. beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall Amen. overcome them and kill them. So this beast is talking about the white man. You understand? It says he ascended out of the bottomless pit, that's Europe, and make war against them. They made war with us. You understand? When they conquered us, destroyed everything of ours, they stole from us, they robbed us. They took our money and our riches, our clothes too, and shall overcome them and kill them. They overcame us, they put us in slavery. You understand? They put us in slavery and they killed many of our forefathers and more foremothers. They raped our sisters. They killed our children. They fed our children to dogs. They fed our children to crocodiles so they can what? Catch the crocodiles and make leather shoes and leather belts. That's what the white men did. You understand? During the 1600s, guess who came over here? I'm going to deal with that thing now in a second. Read the verse again, verse 7, because I'm showing the history when they came back into power. When they made war with us, this is what they did. Okay? Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the mm -hmm. beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, let's deal with that. The beast that ascended up out of the bottomless pit shall make war with them and shall overcome them. Now, this is what will shock you. Watch this. Let me share my screen. I want you to read that. Read that thing for me. Some of you are shocked. Read what you got. Read that. Slavery in South Africa. Reading mm. from wikipedia.org. I want you to read that part again because nobody, some people don't believe that. Read it again. Slavery in South Africa. Slavery in Zanzi, South Africa. Okay, read. Slavery in South Africa existed from 1653 in the Dutch Cape colony until the abolition, until the abolition of slavery in the British Cape colony on 1st January 1834. So slavery existed in 1653 through the Dutch Cape colony. These are Boers. These are Boers, Afrikaners. You understand? The Dutch Cape colony until the abolition of slavery in the British Cape colony on 1st Jan 1834. So slavery existed here. So we want to find out who landed a year before. Keep reading. This followed the British banning 
the trade of slaves between colonies in 1807 with mm -hmm. their emancipation by 1834. So they think, because that's what they say, they say the abolition of slavery in South Africa ended in 1834. But in 1834, our forefathers and foremothers were still picking cotton in the plantation, in Rustenburg, cotton, Limpopo, cotton, Limpopo, oranges, Limpopo, avocados. Hmm? You understand? Limpopo, sugarcane, hmm? um, Mpumalanga, you understand? Maize. You see that thing? Rustenburg, tobacco. Let's get there. Hold on a second. Let me say, let me let me let me show some pictures. Hold on a second, one second. Oh yes. No, we must share it. Yeah. We gotta see this thing. Okay, hold on a second. I have to showcase this thing. The people must see the stuff. Okay. Let me share my screen. There it is, right there. You see that? All praises, all praise to the most high. So okay. research right here. Okay. It's like everything is just lining up. Yeah. The spirit is on. All praise to the Lord this day. Now, watch this. You see that part right there? 1652 to present day. The truth about apartheid. Now, when you look at this, right? Let me enlarge them stuff here so you can see. Look at this. Okay, read that. Read the, the title of the flyer because this is one of the camp posters we use when we teach on the streets. Okay, read that. The truth about apartheid, 1652 till present. To present day, okay. Read the scripture that we write in there. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 65. Mm -hmm. And among these nations shall thou find no ease neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. That's exactly what you are seeing here. Failing of eyes, sorrow of mind, and trembling of heart. And we're not going to have ease when we arrive over here. Now look at that. This is Rustenberg, 1900s. Rustenberg cotton, right? So what we just read on the article, they said the abolition of slavery ended in 1834, but that's not correct according to what we're reading here. The 1900s, because when you look at this, this is just that it's a bit blurry, but because this is a book that Esau was hiding. I got this out of the book that I bought on Take A Lot. Yeah, Take A Lot. Look at our foremothers here in Rustenburg, 1900s. Not the not 19th century, no, 1900s. Because 19th century would mean 1800s. No, 1900s. Rustenburg, this is the cotton plantation. I picked cotton Pella, when I was in high school. So what are they talking about when they say slavery was abolished in South Africa in 1834? That's a lie. Now look at that. That's Rustenburg right there. 1938. Rustenburg tobacco. This is the tobacco field. You understand? And they, it was ministered by, administered by the Germans. The Germans were the ones that were doing this to our forefathers and foremothers. Look at our foremother right there. You understand? She's topless, pushing this thing. Could you imagine that? Mm. And you see, she's still young, man. Look at her. Now look at that. That's a bure, man. That's a bure. That's an Africans. That's an Africans white devil. Now look at our brothers in the in Pumalanga in 1880. They say slavery ended in 1834. This is 1880. When the what? This is the maize plantation. You understand? That's what we're reading here. Look at that. That right there is the Rysel wine farm. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something. Before we proceed any further, give me the book of Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to show you about the cotton. Okay. Deuteronomy 28. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Read verse, read verse 31. The 2028 verse 31. I'm going to show you something here with this. Okay, watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 31. Read. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, mm -hmm. and thou shalt not eat thereof. Why? Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy, thy face. 
and Me? shall not be restored to thee. Mm -hmm. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. You see that part right there? It says, thy ox shall be slain before thine eyes, because they took our cattle, they took our cows, our goats, and our sheep. It says, because we use them to plow. It says, thine ass shall be violently taken away from thy before thy face. We use the donkeys, you understand, to plow the fields and to, to, to take care of our families. It says, and shall not be restored to thee. They didn't bring our animals back. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies. Because you get wool from sheep. You get wool from sheep and cotton too. You still get it from sheep. Yes, you can plant cotton in the cotton plantation, but you also get wool and cotton from sheep. So yes, they took our, our animals and all that, but guess what? They got the wool from there. You understand that? So what we're reading here is going into taking our resources from us. That's what we're reading here in Deuteronomy 28, verse 31. So I want you men and women to pay attention. Okay? So now, watch this. Hmm. Give me the book. Read, jump down to verse 38. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38. Uh -huh. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and mm. shall gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. That's the locust right there. The white man. He's the locust. You understand? He is the locust. That's the white man right there in Western Cape. The wine farm. The great plantations. Look at our foremothers and forefathers here and their children. You understand? That's what we're reading here. Okay? Now, read on verse 39. Come on. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress mm -hmm. them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You see that thing? So it says, thou shalt plant vineyards. That's what we're doing here. Our forefathers and foremothers, they are planting vineyards. That's our brother right there. That's our brother right there. That's our mother. That's the children. That's the white man supervising this thing. That's our mothers planting these vineyards. You see that thing? Brothers planting the vineyards of the white man. And the locusts will just come and eat them. Okay? That's what we're reading here. Drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes. For the worms shall eat them. Who's the worm? The white man. That's the worm. Jump up to verse 33. So we can deal with the fruit of our land. Because this also goes into the fruit of our land. The cotton, that's the fruit of our land. You understand? The maize, that's the fruit of our land. The grapes, that still goes into the fruit of our land. So don't get it twisted. Read verse 33. Come on. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 33. Read. The fruit of thy land. And mm -hmm. all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. You see that thing? The fruit of our land, it not only does it go into the grapes, the cotton, the maize, and so forth, but it also goes into what? The mineral resources on the ground, the gold, the platinum, the diamonds. This is Kimberley, where they are mining diamonds. These are our forefathers. Look at the white man, the white woman. They are supervising us working in the mines in Kimberley. You see that thing right there? That's what we, and he says, we shall be only oppressed and crushed always. That, that's colonization. Stealing of our land and our resources and kicking us out and pushing us into what? Into the ghettos, into the, in the cassis, where we're living like rats and sardines. You understand that thing? And when they are living large in the best places of the earth. So that's what we're reading here. You understand? That's what we're reading here. So this thing of saying, no, slavery ended in 1834, that's a lie. That's a lie. In fact, in Limpopo, in places like um, Rutan, in places like Crazy, you understand? They're still doing that in the, in, the, in the plantation, enslaving our fathers and mothers. The Buras are still doing that in Limpopo today. So that thing of slavery ended, that's, that did not happen. That's just a, those are just fairy tales, okay? That's just fairy tales by the white man. Now, let's go back. Now, I want you to read that. Slavery in South Africa. I had to bring that out to show you that this thing of say slavery ended, that's just a lie. Now, read what you got. Slavery in South Africa. Dutch rule. 
in 1652. No, yeah, no, 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 no. Slavery in South Africa. Now I want you to read that paragraph again. Excuse me, sir. Slavery in South Africa. Go ahead. Slavery in South Africa existed from 1653 in the Dutch Cape Colony until the abolition of slavery in the British Cape Colony on 1st January 1834. Go ahead. This followed the British banning the trade of slaves between colonies in 1807 with their emancipation by 1834. So according to them, it says they banned the trade of slaves between colonies in 1807 and with their emancipation, meaning emancipation of slaves in 1834. No, that's a lie. Keep reading. Dutch rule. Mm -hmm. In 1652, Jan van Riebeck set up a refreshment station for ships bound to the Dutch East Indies in what is now Cape Town and requested slaves. You see that thing? Because in the in the schools, they don't teach that. They just teach that no, Jan van Riebeck came to South Africa in 1652 to do what? Because he, he was looking for spices. Isn't that the same thing they said with Christopher Columbus? They said the same thing with Christopher Columbus. They say no, Christopher Columbus in 1492, when, when Isabella and King Ferdinand uh, sent him, he says he was looking for spices. He was just looking for India. But he had soldiers, he, has a, he had a band of soldiers with him looking for spices. Are you kidding? They just lie. You understand? Give me that in Isaiah, give me that in Psalms real quick. Give me Psalms. They just lie. Even in the schools, they just taught us all the wrong stuff. When we're reading about Christopher Columbus, none of it was true. They just put some, no, no, not Christopher Columbus, but Jan van Riebeck. Give me that in Psalm 58. Psalm 58 and verse. Three. Watch this. Psalm chapter 58, verse 3. Go ahead. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Mm -hmm. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking mm -hmm. lies. You see that thing? The most that God is saying, the white people, Esau, Edom, Idumia, he says, they are estranged from the womb. Meaning what? Their soul that is lifted up in him is not right in them. From their womb. He says they go astray as soon as they are born. Meaning they go the hell off as soon as they are born. Meaning to go against the Bible, speaking lies. As soon as that white baby comes out of their mother's womb, when they are crying, they just be lying. Okay? Now, let's go back. Read that, read that thing again. Dutch rule. Read it. Dutch rule. In 1652... Jan van Riebeck set up a refreshment station for ships bound to the Dutch East Indies in what is now Cape Town and requested slaves. You see that? The, 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 the spices had nothing to do with it. You understand? They were not getting refreshments. They came here for slaves. Okay, go ahead. The first slave, Abraham van Batavia, arrived in 1653. Van Batavia meaning from Batavia. The name Jakarta during the Dutch colonial period and shortly so after. Now the, fir the, the first slave that arrived was Ibrahim Batavia, who arrived in 1653, you understand, from Batavia, okay, during the Dutch colonial period. Go ahead. And shortly afterward, a slaving voyage was undertaken from the Cape to Mauritius and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. You see that? So where did they, where, so where are these slaves coming from? It says a slaving voyage was undertaken from the Cape to Mauritius and Madagascar. So they transported slaves from Cape Town to Mauritius and Madagascar. Where did they get these people from? They, con they got them here from South Africa. You understand? They transported many of them to Mauritius and Madagascar. Go ahead. Eventually, Van Riebeck forcibly enslaved Africans for work in the Cape Colony. You see what Van Riebeck did? Eventually, he says, Van Riebeck forcibly enslaved, meaning Israelites, for work in the Cape Colony. So Van Riebeck was not here for no spices or refreshments. He was here for slaves. You understand? He was here for slaves and for land and for minerals upon the land that the slaves owned. 
That's the only reason why he was here. Let me look up something. Hold on a second. Hmm. One second. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm going to show you something here. Hopefully, you brothers can see that. Is the sub Sahara slave trade, but I'm going to show you something here um, on the map, right? Um, let me just decrease it. I'm going to show you really what's going on. Watch this. Now, I want you to read that. This is the sub Sahara slave trade. Okay, read the title Trans Sahara slave trade, 652 AD till current. Now, I'm gonna enlarge this so you can see what's written here. Okay, I know it's blurring up now, but let's see. Let's see if you can see it. Oh yes, yeah. Hold on. Okay, I want you to look at that. Now, when you look at this slave trade route, right, on the continent, now look at that. This is Bartholomew Diaz. You see that? Bartholomew, you have got Bartholomew, because we read, we read, we did history in high school, in primary and high school about Bartholomew Diaz. This is 1487, okay? You see Bartholomew Diaz is collecting slaves on the continent, South Africa, Monomotapa, Bena, Mozambique, okay? Yeah, that's what you're seeing here, Bena, uh, Mozambique. Monomotapa, Limpopo, you see that thing? Delgoa Bay, this goes into the, 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 the class that we went over when we were seeing the, the Zulu and the Swati slave trade with the Boas, yes. So look at this, you've got Vasco here, this is Vasco da Gama, this is 1497, you've got Cao 1482, okay, 1544, Bartholomew Diaz, 1487 again. You see this thing right here? So these are all, the, these are Portuguese slavers. You understand? Spaniards. Here on the continent, the 14, they see that the, the, Cape, the, 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 the Cape Coast, this is Cape Verde. Okay. Now, let's look at it. 1664, 1471, Gomez. You see that thing? St. Helena, 1502. Look at the dates. 1471, 1456, 1460, 1487, 14, uh, I think that's 63 or something. 1544, 1505. You see that thing? 1620, 1503. 1670, this is Madagascar. Remember I said Madagascar and Mauritius. They got slaves from here. They got slaves from Limpopo, Delgoa Bay, Mozambique, Monomotapa, Bena. Oh, you see that thing? Look at that. The Congo. That's Congo right there. Okay. That's the island of St. Thomas right there. You see that thing? That's Nigeria. You see Yoruba. Okay. Ashanti. I want you to see what's going on here, you brothers. Pay close attention. Look at them. These are the days that when you're going over this stuff, you must make, make, take note, note of the days that we're reading here. Okay? So all these days, they correspond with what we just read. You understand? During the, when Christopher, when, when, when Jan van Riebe got here, Jan van Riebe got here, he came with his friends, who Dagama, Vasco Dagama, Bartholomew Diaz, who Gomez. You understand? He came with his friends when he came here. He wasn't here for spices and re or refreshments. They were here for slaves and the land and the resources upon the land. You see that thing? Now, nah. Jan van Riebeck forcibly read that part right there again. Jan van Riebeck did what? Jan van Riebeck. Van Riebeck forcibly enslaved Africans for work in the Cape Colony. You see what he did? He was not here for no refreshments. He was here for slaves, land and resources on the land, and slave labor, cheap slave labor. 
Okay, read that. Come on. Excuse me, sir, I got disconnected a bit. In April 1657, there were 10 slaves in the settlement from a population of 144. So, so this, this, you see, that's these numbers are just wrong because it says 10 slaves in 1657. Here they just finished saying eventually Van Riebeck forcibly enslaved Africans for work in the Cape Colony. So he only had what? 10 slaves, 144 slaves. When he, he managed to get slaves from, the, from South Africa to Mauritius and Madagascar, he had 10 slaves. These numbers don't make no sense because when you look at the map, let's go back because I know some of you don't get it. You see the map again? Not yet, sir. Okay, let me just share my screen once again so we can see it. Because I want you brothers to see the, 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 the white man just puts lies in. Look at this. You see the map, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now look at the look at look at the, the slave route within the continent and around the continent. You understand? Look at just, just look at just here. This is Cape Town. This is now going towards the east. Now that goes into Limpopo, Monomotapa, Mozambique. You understand? They'll go up there and so forth. Let's Madagascar, Mauritius, which is up there. So you telling me that 10 slaves, 144 slaves for all these slave routes here, the, the slave trade routes that you see here, there is no way. That's impossible. You see this thing? Yes, sir. Okay. I hope you brothers can see that. Hmm. You have to put the pieces together as you're reading this stuff. Okay, now read that. In 1657, read that part again. In 16... Okay, in April... Your mind. Okay, come on. Yes, sir. In April 1657, there were 10 slaves in the settlement from a population of 144. That increased greatly the next year when the Dutch captured a Portuguese slaver with 500 Angolan slaves and 250 were taken to the Cape. So now they went to Angola to get 500 slaves, 250 were taken to the Cape. Read on. Which these numbers are not, they are very suspect. It doesn't make sense based on what we're looking at the map. Read. Two months later, a further 228 slaves arrived from Guinea. Because that's where we were coming from after we left Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Bantus, we settled, many of us were in the Gulf of Guinea. Many of us were. Many of us, um, we were taken to India. You understand? East India by the Arabs. There's a lot of Bantus in India. Okay? We're going to read about that in a sec. Keep going. The process, the process was enhanced when settler colonialism commenced when former Dutch East India Company officials were granted land lots. You see what they did? They gave themselves land lots. They gave themselves land that didn't belong to them. Give me a back of chapter one, verse six. They gave themselves land that did not belong to them. You understand? So they were not, like, like, I remember I showed you, I said, they were not here for refreshments. They were here for slaves. They were here for land. They were here for the resources upon the land. It's got nothing to do with the refreshment. Okay. Habakkuk 1 verse 6. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6. Go ahead. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that mm -hmm. bitter and hasty nation, which the shall march. The Chaldeans is another name for Esau. Give me that in Ezra 5 verse 12. You understand? Let's see who are the Chaldeans. Okay, let's go there. Ezra 5 is 12. I'm showing you how they made war with us. So don't forget the thought that we read in Revelation 18 verse 7. Okay. Revelation 11. Um, what verse was that? Was it verse 7? Might be verse 7. Yeah. So get that. How about book 1? Read, read Ezra 5 verse 12 again. Ezra chapter 5 verse 12. 
Mm -hmm. But after that, our fathers have provoked the God of heaven unto rest. Go ahead. He gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean. Mm -hmm. The what? The Chaldean. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean. Go ahead. Who destroyed his house and carried the people away into Babylon. So the Nebuchadnezzar was, was a what? Was a king, was the king of Babylon. He was called the Chaldeans because the Chaldeans were the upper echelons of the Kushan Empire during that time. But remember what we read in Revelation 13. It says what? He has at the feet of a bear and what? The mouth of a lion. So Babylon, the ancient Kusha, is there the symbol of a lion. When, I met, when the Esau took over, he took the attributes of the ancient empires, which was the lion. You understand? Great Britain took that. So he's talking about Esau when he says the Chaldean here. You understand? Give me that in Psalms 137 verse 7. So we understand who is the Chaldean. The Chaldean is Babylon, but Esau is also called the Chaldean. I'll show you why. Psalms 137 verse 7, read that. Psalm chapter 137 verse 7. Mm -hmm. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. You see that thing? It says, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. So the subject matter here is about the Edomites. Esau, Edom, Idumia. Today they call themselves Caucasians, Europeans, you understand? Dutch, Netherlands, Bures, Afrikaners, okay? It says, who in the day of Jerusalem said, raise it, raise it, me destroy it, destroy it, even unto the foundation thereof. Go ahead. When Nebuchadnezzar came against us, the Esau, Edom, they helped them against us. Go ahead. Oh, daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. You see, what, you see what King David is calling Edom? He says, Edom is the daughter of Babylon. You see that thing? So when he says the Chaldeans, he's talking about Esau, Edom in that context in Habakkuk 1 verse 6. Okay, read. Oh, daughter of Babylon, who mm -hmm. are to be destroyed. Happy Wait. shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast saved us. You see that? Happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast saved us. Go ahead. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Because they were killing our daughters and our sons. They were, they were holding our, the, uh, the, the, the feet of our sons and daughters and dashing their skulls against the stones to blood for blood to gush out. That's what the Spaniards was doing. That's what who Christopher Columbus was doing. That's what the Jan van Riebeck was doing. You understand? The Dutch. Okay, give me that in Judith, chapter 16, verse 5. You know what? Before you give me Judith, give me first Ezra 445. First Ezra chapter 4, verse 45. What we read in your it says, raise it, raise it even unto the foundation thereof. First Ezra 4, verse 45. Read that. First Ezra chapter 4, verse 45. Come on. Thou also hast vowed to build up the temple, which the Edomites burned when Judea was made desolate by the Chaldees. That's what our forefather King David was mentioning in Psalms 137, verse 7. You understand? When it says, Thou hast also vowed to build up the temple which the Edomites burned when Judea was made desolate by the Chaldeans. They what? The Babylonians. You see that thing? So what we're reading here, what King David is prophesying is the same thing that what? That Ezra is saying here. Okay? Now give me Judith 16 verse 5. Read that. Judith chapter 16 verse 5. Mm -hmm. He prayed that he would burn up my borders and kill my young men with the sword. And yes. death the sucking children against the ground. You see that thing? That's what we read in Psalms 137, verse 9. Go ahead. And make my infants as a prey and my virgins as a spoil. You see what they were doing? Is that they were praying that they were killing our young men. When they arrived here in South Africa, Jan van Riebeck and his friends that were also 
colonizing other parts of the continent, Angola, Guinea, Ghana, Nigeria, Namibia, because the Germans are over there. They slaughtered and killed the Hereros. Those, were, those are Israelites. The Germans are still over there in Vent Hook. You understand? The Herero genocide that was perpetrated by the Bures. You see that thing? So what we're reading here is that the law says they are bragging about this thing, that they would burn up on my borders, meaning they destroyed Jerusalem. They killed our young men with the sword and dashed our children against the stones and make thy infants as prey and my virgins as spoil because they were selling our young, our young daughters. They were sleeping with them. They were raping them in exchange for booze and wine and alcohol. That's what these white men was doing. They are still doing it today. I'm going to show you that thing. Okay. Now, go back to Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6. Read that. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6. Mm -hmm. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land. The breadth of the land, the breadth of the land is the best places of the land. The breadth of the land is the best part of the land. You understand? Read. To possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. To own, to, to, to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs because the land don't belong to them. That's why Jan van Riebeck, you understand? That's why Jan van Riebeck, when he came, that's what we see what we're reading here. What did it say? It says, they gave themselves land lots. Where did we read that? He said, they gave themselves land lots. Yes, sir, right there where the cursor is. Dutch East Indian. Yes, that's it right there. It says, the Dutch East India Company officials were granted land lots to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They don't own anything on this land. They got, they got it by violence. They gave themselves land lots. So was the land vacant? No, it wasn't. The land wasn't vacant. So how did they take the land? Let's get that in Micah 2. Micah 2 verse 2. Because here is saying, they possess the what they possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. How did they possess the dwelling places? How did they give themselves land lots? Because the land wasn't vacant. There was people in the land. Okay, read that in Micah. Micah two verse two. Read it. Micah chapter two verse two. Go ahead. And they covered fields. Our and lands. Them by violence. You see when it says they covered fields, plural, lands. Go ahead. And take them by violence. You see how they possess the dwelling places that were not theirs? They took the lands from us through violence, killing. You understand? Murder. Go ahead. And houses. And take them away. They kicked our people, our forefathers and foremothers out of their houses that they built for themselves. Read. So they oppress a man in his house, mm -hmm. even a man and his heritage. That's exactly what the white men did. They are still doing it today. That's why they don't want to give up the land because they know that land is not theirs. Why do you think they have guns on the property? They have bullets. They have got weapons on the property. Why? Because they let the land don't belong to them. So you are always on guard waiting in case the owner of the land comes back and says, give me my land back. Look at Israel today. You understand? Look at Israel. Israel is like a police state. There's, there's like police all over in Israel today. Its world is guarded, that place, because they know that don't belong to them. That land is not theirs. Those Jewish bastards in our land, yeah, they are bastards because God calls them so in Zechariah 9 verse 6. You understand? But they oppress a man in his house, even a man and his heritage. That's why the Dash East India Company officials they were says they were says we granted land lots. They got it through violence. Okay, let's read. Let's keep reading. The, the agricultural settlements. The agricultural settlements of the Boers economically dislocated the, the pastoral Koi Koi in Table Bay. So now they took the land from the Koi Koi as well. Read on. 
who were forced to serve as servants due to their loss of grazing land. Now I'm going to show you something here. You see that part right there? That part right there. Hmm. Now read that part again, the agricultural work. The agricultural settlements of the Boers economically dislocated the, the, pastoral, the pastoral Koi Koi in Table Bay, who were forced uh -huh. to serve as servants. You see that part right there? They were forced to serve as servants due to their loss of grazing land as servants. This whole time we're reading about slavery and slaves. But when it comes to the Koi Koi, it says, they were forced to serve as servants, not as slaves. You see the difference? Keep reading. Go ahead. Due to their loss of grazing land, the Dutch colonists additionally imported slaves from Portuguese Mozambique. That's what, French we, were the map. That's what we were looking at the map. He says the colonists additionally imported slaves from Portuguese Mozambique. French Mara is letting you is letting you know the people that conquered Mozambique were the Portuguese. The people that conquered France, I mean, Madagascar is the French. The people that conquered India is the Dutch. But I'm going to show you the people that the so-called, they say, no, there was a lot of Indian slaves. I'm going to show you what they are. Read on. French Madagascar and Dutch India. Slaves in the Dutch colonies were given poor food subject to poor living conditions and mm -hmm. punished with whipping for fleeing or disobeying orders. You see what they was doing? And when we would run away, they would now start to put out um, advertisement on newspapers that says runaway slaves. That's what they would do. You understand? That's what they did. Now, watch this. Mm. Okay, read that. British rule. Because the British and the Boers they were fighting for the slaves. You understand? They were fighting for slaves, land, and resources upon the land. Keep reading. British rule. British rule. Threats to Dutch control of the Cape Colony had emerged in the 18th century when the Dutch East India Company was weakened during the First Anglo-Dutch War. Meaning they went to war. Read on. During the 1780s, troops of the French Royal Army were stationed in the Cape to prevent invasion by Great Britain. Wait. The Cape was invaded by the British in 1795 during the War of the First Coalition and occupied until 1803. So now the Dutch and the British were fighting, they went to war. Okay, so they are fighting against amongst themselves because there's no honor among thieves. Go ahead. Britain later formally annexed the Cape and later passed the Slave Trade Act 1807. You see that thing? That's when the beginning when they say they started to deal with the abolition of slavery. Go ahead. It was enforced from 1808, ending the external slave trade. Slaves were permitted to be traded only within the colony. So you see that it didn't that 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 it doesn't mean they stopped. It's a slaves. Slaves were permitted to be traded only within the colony. So there was still trade going on of slaves. Read. Right? At the same time, Parliament passed a series of acts known as the amelioration laws designed to provide better living conditions for slaves. So they you see they still had slaves. You see that they still had slaves. Go ahead. These acts allowed slaves to marry, purchase their own freedom, live with their families, and receive a basic education. So now think about it. It says these acts, the better living conditions, so they call them, it says these acts allowed slaves to marry. As if that's not, that, that is not what we was doing. We were married. We were getting married during slavery. But when you got married, here's what, here's what the white man did. Get to 28. When we got married, here's what the white man did. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 30. Deuteronomy 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 30. Come on. Thou shalt be thrown a wife, and another man shall lie with her. You see that? You're going to be thrown a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Who's this another man? The white man, the bure, the Dutch man, the British man. You get married, guess what? Before you sleep with your wife, the white man says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have her for a night to rape her, to defile her, and give her back to you. What the hell is that? And that's, the, that's what they were doing. They are still doing it today in Limpopo because they are still, our people are still enslaved in those plantations today. You understand? Go ahead. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes, the grapes thereof. Because the worms and the locusts shall eat it. Okay, now read that. These eggs, I need you to read a little faster here. Come on. These eggs allowed slaves to marry, purchase their own freedom, live with their families, and receive the basic education. One education. The eggs, right? the eggs also limited punishments and work hours and encouraged missionaries to convert Africans to Christianity. Yeah, that's it right there. You see that part right there? I will read that again. The eggs did what? The eggs also limited punishments and work hours and encourage missionaries to convert Africans to Christianity. You see that? You see what they were doing? They were forcing white Jesus on us, on the slave plantations. They forced slave, they forced white Jesus on us. So on the slave plantations, they, they sent missionaries to convert our people to worship white Jesus. Revelation 13, 15. Let's see if that happens. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. Go ahead. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, uh -huh. that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see that thing? When we did not conform to Christianity, they were killing us in those plantations. They were killing us. The, the Dutch, you understand? The British, they were killing us, these Buddhists. That's what they were doing because we did not want to bow down to white Jesus and they were slaughtering many of us. Okay, read that. The first large wave of British settlers, the 1820 settlers were not permitted to own slaves. I don't believe that thing. That's a lie. Okay, now let's move on to the next piece. I want you to read that. Reading from essayhistory.org.za, South African History Online. Mm -hmm. History of slavery and early colonization in South Africa. With colonialism, mm -hmm. which began in South Africa in 1652, came the slavery and forced labor model. This was the original model of colonialism brought by the Dutch in 1652, and subsequently, exported from the Western Cape to the African Republics of the Orange Free State and Zaid Afrikanish Republic. So now you see the, this one is letting you know that the Jan van Riebeck did not come here for refreshments. He says he came with what? He came, he came with slavery and forced labor model, not for refreshments. He says this was the original model. Let me read. It says, this was the original model of colonialism brought by the Dutch in 1652. So they were not here for refreshments and subsequently exported from the Western Cape to the African Republic of the Orange Free State. The Orange Inco Free State, they pushed that too. The African Czech Republic. Many South Africans are the descendants of slaves brought to the Cape Colony from 1653 till 1822. Let me read that part again. Many South Africans are the descendants of slaves brought to the Cape Colony from 1653 until 1822. That's why you saw there on the map, the slave trade rules within the continent. The changes wrought on African society by the imposition of European colonial rule occurred in quick succession. In fact, it was the speed with which change occurred that set the colonial era apart from earlier periods in South Africa, of course. Not all societies were equally transformed. 
Some resisted the forces of colonial intrusion. Of course, we did that. Slavery and forced labor for extended periods. Others, however, such as the Quekoi communities of Southern and West Cape, disintegrated within a matter of decades. Initially, a colonial contact was a two-way process. However, Africans were far from helpless victims in the initial encounter. Colonial contact was not simply a matter of Europeans imposing themselves on African society, societies. For their part, African rulers saw many benefits to be had from maintaining relations with Europeans for a considerable period of time. They engaged with Europeans voluntarily and on their own terms. So this is not talking about actual Africans. It's talking about Hamites. It's not talking about, it's talking about Hamites here. When he says Africans here, we're not we're far from helpless victim is making reference to these hemitic nations. Then you can go to ASR, you can find the class on that. Okay. Give me that in um give me that in Joel 3, real quick. Joel chapter 3. Okay, Joel 3 and verse 4. Read that. Joel chapter 3, verse 4. Mm -hmm. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre? And Zidon, and these all the coast. Tyre and Zidon, these are Hamites. Go ahead. And all the coasts of Palestine. These are the Palestinians. Palestine. Palestinians here. Go ahead. Will he render me a recompense? And if he recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Read. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. You see what they did? So they were not here for refreshments. They were here for slaves, land, the silver and the gold that is upon the land, mineral resources. Go ahead. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem uh -huh. have ye sold unto the Christians that ye might remove them far from their border. You see that thing? So the Hamites were working together with the Palestinians to sell us, okay? So that's what we read in here, okay? Uh, let's keep going. Most importantly, the trade with Europeans gave African rulers access to crucial aspect of European technology, namely firearms, meaning guns. More than anything else, those who had ownership and control over, over firearms were able to gather around themselves, larger and larger groups of people. In short, the ownership of firearms turned into a status symbol and a means to gain political power. Certainly, the article of trade in which Europeans showed the greatest interest in which Africans were prepared to sacrifice were slaves. You see that? The Atlantic slave trade stands at the center of a long history of European contact with Africa. This is the goes into the transatlantic. This was the era of African diaspora because our forefathers and foremothers, we ran deeper into the continent when we ran from the white Vespasian and his son Tyrus in 70 AD when they destroyed the holy city of Jerusalem. You understand? Get that in Luke 21 verse 20 real quick. Luke chapter 21 verse 20. Come on. And when he shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Meaning the destruction of Jerusalem is nigh. Go ahead. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. You see what Christ is commanding us is those of you that are in Jerusalem, you must run deeper into the continent of Africa and hide because we're already on the continent. So, but it says run deeper into the continent, okay? Because these be the days of vengeance. Okay, read on, verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The things that are written in Deuteronomy 28, the curses, the judgments that will come upon us for breaking God's laws. So Christ is, is, is prophesying, is commanding us, let's listen, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The year was 70 AD by Vespasian and his son Titus. So that's what this is going into here, that... Um, the, when he said the African diaspora, he's talking about Israelites who were coming from Jerusalem, which fell in 70 AD from Vespasian and Tyrus, which were white men, the Romans. And all embracing term, Euro, historians have used 
to describe the consequences of the slave trade, estimates of the number of slaves transported from their African homes to European colonial possession in the Americas range from nine to 15 million people. No, no, that's not true. Because during the transatlantic slave trade, 100 million of our forefathers during the Middle Passage who died. So when it says nine to 15 million, that's nothing. Although a great deal of violence accompanied the trade in slaves, the sheer scale of operation involved a high degree of organization. So these nations were well organized in order to sell us, and they knew who they were selling. On the part of both Europeans and Africans, who are those Africans? Hamites. Hamites. Go to ASR to get more info. And in other words, the Atlantic slave trade could not have taken place without the cooperation or complicity of many Africans, meaning Hamites, the descendants of Ham. They partook in this day. Now let's go down. Slavery at the Cape. Jan van Riebeck, who founded the first colony at the Cape Town, at Cape Town in 1652, was an official of the Dutch East India Company. So he was an official that was giving his white people, Bures, landlords. The Dutch marked their permanence by building a five-pointed stone castle on the shores of the bay, a structure that continues to dominate the city center of Cape Town. From within the walls of the castle, the Vogue administered and governed the expanding colony by what? Slave trade. That goes in, that's the Iziko Museum. At the first, the Dutch were primarily concerned with supplying their ships with fresh produce as they rounded the Cape in route to the spice producing islands of the Indonesia, Indonesian archipelago. No, that's not true. They keep mentioning, because that's what they taught us in school. They say spices and spices, but you have an army looking for spices. This is because the Dutch had their most important colonial interest in Indonesia, which included the growing of crops and spices that could not be produced in Europe because Europe is a bottomless pit, but they could not grow crops here, but they were giving themselves landlords. So that has nothing to do with it. They are still pushing that propaganda. In Indonesia, the Dutch enslaved entire populations because our people is over there as well, ruling them by force and coercing them to produce crops. In the Cape, Van Riebeck first attempted to get cattle and labor through negotiation. But as soon as these negotiations broke down, slavery was implemented. You see what they did? Get that into John 28, verse 49. We read that, we read that earlier, verse 15 now. John 28, not verse 49. But I want verse 51. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 51. Go ahead. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cat and the uh, fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed. You see that thing? Hold on, wait, 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 wait. It says, Van Riebeck first attempted to get cattle and labor through negotiation. That's what we're reading here. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and they will take our cattle as well. The fruit of our land, that's the mineral resources, until thou be destroyed. Meaning when the negotiations broke down, what did they do? He says, they what? Slavery was implemented, forced slave labor which also shall not leave either corn, wine, you see that, or oil, or the increase of thy kind as our cattle, or the flocks of our sheep. They took our cattle and our sheep until he have destroyed thee. That's what Jan van Riebeck did. He did that. That's what we're reading here. And the Bible bears witness to that thing. It says, even with slavery, the Dutch did not have sufficient labor power to provide their for their ships. In 1657, some company officials were released from their contracts and were allocated land along the Lips Big River. So they were giving each other land. Hmm. These officials became known as the free burgers, meaning farmers, the, and formed the nucleus of the white South African population that came to be known as Boas or Afrikaner. They are all the same people. It soon became apparent that if the free burgers, which is the farmers were being Bures, were to be successful at agricultural producers, they would need access to substantial labor. You see that? Slaves. The indigenous peoples with whom the Dutch first came into contact, the Quekoi, had been settled in the region for at least a thousand years before the Dutch arrived. So the land was not vacant and were unwilling labor, were an unwilling labor force. 
This is because the Kwe Kwe were a pastoral people, and as long as they had their lands, flocks of sheep, and herds of cattle, they could not be pressed into service for Dutch settlers. The settlers also practiced a form of settled agriculture that came into direct conflict with the pastoral economy of Kwe Kwe, of the Kwe Kwe and involved regular structured seasonal migration. So they started to push them out to Table Bay. Therefore, as the Dutch settlement expanded, independent Kwe Kwe communities were placed under unbearable pressure. Within 50 years of the establishment of the Dutch settlement, the indigenous communities near Table Bay, despite heroic struggle on their part, had been dispossessed of their lands and their independence means of existence had come to an end. Individual Kwe Kwe men and women became incorporated into colonial society as low status servants, meaning endangered servants. Beyond the mountains of Table Bay, communities of Kwe San as the Kwe Kwe and the indigenous hunger, hunter gatherers Sen are collectively called, survive until the end of the 18th century, which is 1700s, but the but there can be little doubt that for the indigenous population of the Cape, the arrival of the Dutch settlers proved to be a major turning point. Let's see now, watch this. The Dutch settlers were therefore forced to look elsewhere for labor, for their labor needs. You see that? So the Khois were not slaves. They were not enslaved. They were endangered servants. But I'm gonna show you something. In 1658, a year after the first free burghers had been granted their plots of land, who did that? the Dutch East Indian Company, because Fian Ribek was one of the officials. It says the first slaves were imported into South Africa, specifically for agricultural work. These slaves arrived at the Cape on the 28th March, 1658, on board the Amersfoort, that was a slave ship, and had been captured by the Dutch from a Portuguese slaver en route to Brazil. So this ship was going to Brazil. Of the 250 slaves captured, only 170 survived the journey, the journey, survived the journey to Cape Town. Most of these slaves were originally captured by the Portuguese in present day Angola. Remember they said they got 500 slaves from there. On 6 May 15, 1658, 228 slaves from the, another group of slaves arrived at the Cape on board the Hassault, that's a slave ship, from Ghana. Hmm. From 1710 onwards, the adult slave population outnumbered the adult colonial population by as much as three to one. Give me that in the Exodus 1 verse 7. Watch this. Exodus 1 verse 7. Oh, praise to the Lord. Read that for me. Exodus chapter 1 verse 7. Go ahead. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and works exceeding mighty, and mm -hmm. the land was filled with them. You see that thing? We, we, we multiply. The more they enslaved us, the more they, they oppressed us. It says, we increased abundantly, we multiplied, and works exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with us. That's what we're reading here. Okay, let's keep reading. It says, another source, that's the point I wanted to get to. Another source of slaves was the Vok, the return fleets from Batavia, and other places in the east, we sailed from the, from the Cape on their way to Europe. The Vogue officials could not take their slaves with them when they returned home, as slavery was illegal in Netherlands. Therefore, many of these officials sold their slaves at the Cape because they could get a better price for their slaves there than in the East Indies, meaning East India. You see that? So there was a... It, Cape Town was a major one, was one of the major slave ports because the major slave port was, was where? At Inhambani. You understand? Inhambani and Loronko Maki. Remember, Loronko Maki and Inhambani had the best slaves, especially Inhambani, which is bordering Limpopo and Limpopo River and so forth. Now it says, Vogue officials could not take their slaves with them when they returned home. So and slavery was legal in the Netherlands. Therefore, many of these officials sold their slaves at the Cape because they could not, they could get a better price for their slaves there than in the East Indies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Foreign ships on their way to the Americas from Madagascar also slow sold slaves at the Cape. So you've got slaves that were that were taken from Madagascar. Where were they coming from? How did they get to Madagascar? Because Jan van Riebeck. Vasco da Gama, you understand? 
um, Bartholomew Diaz, Gomez and all that, these, these are Spaniards. They took slaves from South Africa to Madagascar and Mauritius, okay? Now watch this. Is that the Indian subcontinent, now let's deal with that. Because what you are looking at here is the Indian Ocean slave routes. I'm gonna show you that next. The Indian subcontinent was the main source of slaves during the early part of the 18th century, meaning early 1700s, 1710 onwards. And approximately 80% of slaves came from India during this period. A slaving station was established in Delgoa Bay, present day Maputo in 1721, but was abandoned in 17, 1731 because between 1731 and 1765, more and more slaves were brought from Madagascar. Now I wanna pause right there. You see this part, it says many of the slaves were coming from India. Hmm, let's see. I want you to read that, Indian Ocean Slave Trade. Read that. Wikipedia.org, Indian Ocean uh -huh. Slave Trade. Great. The Indian Ocean Slave Trade, sometimes known as the East African Slave Trade or Arab Slave Trade, was multi-directional slave trade and has changed over time. Africans were sent as slaves to the Middle East, to Indian Ocean Islands, including Madagascar to the Indian subcontinent and later to the Americas, to America. That's the same thing that we just, that's the same thing we just read uh, on the history, South African history online. That's the same thing. There is the Indian ocean slave trade, who was mainly involved in this, the Arabs, the Arabs and the Hamites and the Portuguese, not our brothers that were conquered in Mozambique and Maputo. Mm -mm. The actual Portuguese, you understand? Now watch this. I want you to, we're gonna read a little bit of history here, but we're gonna move fast. Okay, read that. Early Indian Ocean slave trade. Slave trading in the Indian Ocean goes back to 2500 BCE. Ancient mm. Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, various Indian groups and Persians all traded slaves on small scale across the Indian Ocean and sometimes the Red Sea. So what they are doing here is they are taking us back to where? They are taking us back to the empires that came before these last days. Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, you understand? The Persians and the Medes, because who was the slaves? Us. Go ahead. Slave trading in the Red Sea around the time of Alexander the Great is described by Agathachites. Agathachites. Strabo's Geographica completed after 23 CE, mentions Greeks from Egypt trading slaves at the port of Adilis and other ports on the Somali coast. You see that thing? That's the East now. Go ahead. Pliny the Elder's Natural History, published in 77 CE, also describes Indian Ocean slave trading. In the first century CE, Perip Periplus of the Erythrean. So Periplus of, of the Sea. Periplus of the Erythrean Sea advise of the slave trading opportunities in the region, particularly in the trading of beautiful girls for concubinage. That's our that's our sisters, because in the east, the Arabs and the Hamites and the Portuguese, they were selling many, many the, the slaves, the slaves that were being sold by the Arabs in the east was our sisters mainly. You understand? According to this manual, slaves were exported from Oman, likely near modern day Omen and Kani, and came to the west coast of India. The ancient Indian Ocean slave trade was enabled by building boats capable of carrying large number of human beings. That's our forefathers in the Persian Gulf, using wood imported from India. These shipping, these shipbuilding activities go back to Babylonian and Achaemenid times that's the pageants okay now let me see mm, the one that we want to because this goes back into oh yes yeah gujarati merchants evolved into the first explorers of the indian ocean as they traded slaves as well as african goods such as ivory and tortoise shells so they were killing elephants to get the ivory like they are doing today still okay the Gujaratis were participants in slavery business at Nairobi, Mombasa, Zanzibar, 
and to some extent on the South African region. You see that South Africa, Indonesians um, were also participant and, and brought spices to Africa's shores. They would have returned via India and Sri Lanka with ivory iron skins and slaves. You see that thing? The fruit of our lands and slaves of men. Now, after the involvement of the Byzantine Empire, so uh, Susanian Empire in slave trading in the sixth century AD, that's the 500, it became a major enterprise. Okay, I'm gonna jump down. This part right here. I want you to read this. Muslim period. Read that. Muslim period. Exports of slaves to the Muslim world from the Indian Ocean began after Muslim Arab and Swahili traders won control of the Swahili coast and sea routes during the ninth century. See Zultanate of Zanzibar. These so now, traders captured. You see who was working together? Muslims and Swahili tribes. That's the, that's, the, that's the Maasai tribes in Kenya. The Maasai tribes, that's, those are Hamites. Okay, go ahead. These traders captured Bantu peoples. Zanji. Stop right there. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You see, you see these, these slaves that were coming from India? You see what they were? You see who they are? Bantus. Bantus. So it was not East Indians that were being traded as slaves. No, Bantus were being traded as slaves in the Indian, in the Indian, in the Indian Ocean slave routes by the Arabs, Hamites, and Portuguese. Okay, come on. These traders captured Bantu peoples, Zanji, from the interior in the present day lands of Kenya, Mozambique, and Tanzania and brought them to the coast. Mm -hmm. These, the slaves gradually assimilated in the rural areas, particularly on the Uganja and Pemba Islands. Mm -hmm. Muslim merchants traded an estimated thousand African slaves annually between 800 and 1,700, a number that grew to C4,000 during the 18th century and 3,700 during the period 1800 to 1870. William. So, so, so hold on. So what you are seeing here, um, you see that, you see it says 1,000, 1,000 slaves uh, annually between 800 and 1,700 and number grew to um, uh, 4,000. So this is 817. Hundred, so that's eight hundred. That's centuries, okay. Then four thousand is the number of slaves during this eighteenth century, and and thirty seven hundred uh, thousand, I meaning thirty seven hundred slaves during the period of eighteen and eighteen seventy. So the four thousand, thirty seven hundred, one thousand is number of slaves and so forth, okay. So let me see, let me see, let me see. Mm. Oh yes. Now I want you to read that. Slave, Slave labor. labor. Slave labor in East Africa was drawn from the Zanji, Bantu peoples that lived along the East African coast. The Zanji were, were for centuries shipped as slaves by Muslim traders to all the countries bordering the Indian Ocean. The Amiyad and Abbasid Caliphs recruited many Zanj slaves as soldiers. And as early as 696, there were, there were revolts of Zanj slaves soldiers in Iraq. You see that thing? Now I'm gonna show you. Now, this is letting you know, hmm. Muslims were trading in Bantu peoples, our, our people, because they call us Bantus, okay? It says the Zanj were were for centuries shipped as slaves by Muslim traders to all the countries bordering the Indian Ocean. The, the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphs, these are the Caliphs, recruited many Zanj slaves as soldiers and as early as 696 AD, there was revolts of Zanj slave soldiers in Iraq, meaning there, was, there, was, there were slave revolts in Iraq. So there's our people over there, you know, Afro-Iraqis, Afro-Iraqis. 
A seventh century, the 600 Chinese text mentioned ambassadors from Java presenting the Chinese emperor with two Shengji, meaning Zanj slaves as gifts in 614 AD and eighth and ninth century chronicles meaning mention Shengxi, which is Zanj Bantus slaves reaching China from Hindu kingdom of Sri Vijaya in Java. You see who was trading slaves in India? The East Indians, Hindus, you understand? Uh, Arabs, Hamites, Portuguese. The Zanj Rebellion, a series of uprisings that took place between 869-883 AD near the city of Basran, also known as Basara, situated in present-day Iraq, is believed to have involved the enslaved Zanj that had originally been captured from the African Great Lakes. That includes Limpopo, Monomotapa, Mozambique, Delgoa Bay, okay, region and areas further south in East Africa. It grew to involve over 500,000 slaves and free men who were imported from across the Muslim empire and claim over tens of thousands of lives in Lower Iraq. So they were slaughtering our forefathers. The Zanj who were taken as slaves to the Middle East, you understand, that's Saudi Arabia, and that's Yemen. You see that? That's what we, that's the post, the camp posters that we have. Okay. Um, taken as slaves to the Middle East were often used as strenuous agricultural use, often used in strenuous agricultural work, hard labor, hard bondage. As the plantation economy boomed mm. because of the slaves, the Arabs became richer, agriculture and other manual labor work was brought to, was thought to be demeaning. The resulting labor shortage led to an increased slave market. You see that? So there is more, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna go into a heavy history on this, on this wise one, but not today. I just want to paint a picture for you brothers and sisters to see what's going on. Don't be sleeping up in here. You understand? This is the history of your forefathers and foremothers. Our history. You must know it. Okay? Now, watch this. Remember what we read. Hmm. Go back to Revelation 13. Okay? Verse 7. Let's go back there. Revelation 13, verse 7. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Go ahead. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this white man, when they make when they made war with us, I'm giving an example. So when Jan van Riebeck entered here, it wasn't just him. It was uh, Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz, Gomez. And these are all Portuguese settlers. You understand? Bures, Dutch, the Netherlands the British, they were all working together with the Arabs and Hamites, you understand, to trade us on the continent. That's what they were doing. They made war with us and they were not working alone. They, they, they had allies, these other nations, because they know who we are, the children of Israel. Okay, now watch this. Now give me Revelation 11 verse 7. Read that. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. You see, that's what we were reading. Look at the numbers of the killings that they were doing when they were conquering us, taking our lands by violence, and they never returned the land back. They still are in the, they are, they are still. They are still in possession of stolen land and goods and mineral resources that they are reaping every day from this continent on a daily basis. From the time of the Berlin Conference in 1884 until this day, they are still doing that. You understand? Now watch this. Okay, go back to Malachi now. Let's go back to Malachi chapter 1 verse 4 again. Malachi, chapter 1, verse 4. Mm -hmm. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. You see that thing? They will return and build the desolate places. When they returned, how did they build the desolate places? They robbed us. They enslaved us. They stole from us. They killed, they murdered, they raped, 
they pillaged everything of ours in order for them to be on top. And who was behind them? Satan, the spiritual demon Satan, because that's who they worship. All the empires that they owned, we built it. You understand? The blood of our forefathers. All the, these, these, when you see all these skyscrapers that they are building, listen, they are all floating on a pool of blood of our forefathers and foremothers. So don't never forget that. You look at your sentence, you look at your, your Cape Town, look at uh, where the, the white people are, where they have like the best places and all of that. When you investigate who was sitting there before, our forefathers, they were on that land. They killed them, they buried their bodies underground, they build on top of them. Don't get it twisted. Do not get it twisted. I'm going to prove that. Get that in Revelation 18. Okay. Revelation 18 verse 24. Read what you got. Revelation chapter 18 verse 24. Mm -hmm. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of Wait. saints and mm. of all that were slain upon the earth. You see that thing? It says in here. Wherever these white people are, guess what? In them, underground, the land that they stole from us, it says you are, you are going to find the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all that was killed upon the earth. So wherever they are settling, wherever they stay, you just dig, you will find the bones at the bottom. Literally, you will find those things. I mean, look, so fire town. So fire town was bombed under the rulership of who? D.F. Malan, Daniel Francois Malan. He bombed that place. Our forefathers had businesses. They had restaurants. They had, we owned hotels over there. They bombed us. Understand that? Now watch this. I'm going to show you something. Bro. Hmm. Let me share my screen. Now, let me play this because this is what's going on in the media right now. Julius Malema, okay, he's um, in court because there's a court case going on between Julius and the Afri Forum, right? Now, watch this. It's quite a heat today in court for EFF leader Julius Malema. He stuck to his guns that the Shoot the Boy song does not incite violence. Malema also addressed his followers outside court, saying white races still need to pay. Now he says the EFF struggle is for a just cause. Malema defended the use of the song, which is the subject of AfriForum's hate speech challenge. NCA's Mangoba Tkulu was at the Equality Court today and joins us uh, to give us the very latest. So this has been going on all week, Mangoba. Uh, Julius Malema was facing some tough questions today about the song uh, and concerns that it could be linked to the murder of farmers. What did he have to say? Well, certainly, Julius Malema really sticking to his guns on uh, the testimony that he had given before court. Firstly, to say that uh, the struggle song itself was not formulated by EFF. It was not founded by EFF. And in fact, uh, he says that as a party, they'll continue to sing this song. And this is because he says that uh, the song itself should not be taken in its literal meaning. He says that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, when this song is sung, it's just to communicate the sort of struggle that people are going through at the time. So it should not be taken literally as if it is an instructive song, as if it's a song that tells people to go and do a certain action. Of course, he says that his members are going to continue. He has denied, of course, seeing it outside court in Senegal, saying that, uh, in fact, uh, they are looking for the wrong person if they say that he was singing that particular song. But when it comes to the issue of racism, because what uh, really today was about was about uh, Afri Forum's lawyers trying to poke hole and to show Malema that uh, he has no regard, uh, in fact, for the killing of uh, farmers in this country and that simply he is a racist uh, uh, that's what uh, perhaps from the line of questioning we understood Sally. but my lemma saying that he cannot be a racist if he himself is one of the oppressed take a listen to what I had to say when the white people came here and took our land they didn't come and take our land as an individual they took it as settlers and then pushed us to a land that is not even productive and made us to stay like uh, sardines in congested environments 
with no economic opportunities. It is white people who must be ashamed of what they've done to us. You cannot turn tables now and want to blame me for the crimes committed by white people. It is a white regime that killed children in 1976. It is the white regime that killed children in the 80s and in the early 90s. It is white people who engaged in the wars of dispossession and forcefully took our land and our cows. Why can't you take responsibility? Why can't you for once just say sorry for the crimes we've committed against you? Why do you want to become victims when we are the biggest victims here? When we have lost everything? When we as black people remain a, a traumatized nation? A nation that doesn't know what the future holds for them? At least you are guaranteed the future. At least you know if it doesn't work for you here, you can go somewhere else. We've got nowhere to go. And then you come here and want to accuse me, a victim of racism, of being a racist. It's a huge insult, not only to me, but to black people. Madiba coerced us into reconciling with people who have never been one with. That was a myth. It is unrealistic. You can't reconcile if you have never been together. You never came here with an intention to be with us. You came here with an That's intention true. to conquer. That's what we've been reading this whole time. Are you brothers seeing this? All praises. Yes, sir. That's what we've been reading this whole time since the class started. You understand? We've been seeing this. That's what we've been reading this whole time. But there's a couple of things that he mentioned. He mentioned about Rory. These people, they came, they met us, you understand? They killed, they traumatized us, and we are victims of apartheid, colonial colonization, you understand? Slave trade, forced migration, and oppression, which is all true, you understand? But the thing that Julius Malama does not understand, he's expecting, he's expecting um, Iso Irom, the Caucasian race, Afri Forum, you understand? All these white people, to, to say sorry, no, that's not going to happen. And I'm going to prove that, why that will not happen. Give me the book. Give me the book of Abaku real quick. I'm going to show you something. So whatever he, what, what he's expecting, that's never going to happen. He must not hold his breath. He needs a flyer. Julius needs a flyer. Give me that in Abaku 2. Abaku chapter 2. Read verse, read verse 5. Okay, watch this. You know what? Start at verse 4. Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The Habakkuk, the Lord is going to, is using Habakkuk to prophesy about the white man, the type of man, the type of spirit that he's rolling with. Read that. Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Mm -hmm. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Read. But the just shall live by his faith. That's that the just is us that keeping God's laws. He says, but his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. The most wise God is saying, this man's soul is not upright. You understand? His soul is crooked. His soul is the spirit of the devil. So whatever, he, if he's expecting sorry from a white man, that's not going to happen. You understand? He must not hold his breath. He's not going to get that because the most wise God is telling you, says, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in the white man. Because his mind, his spirit is the spirit of the devil. You understand? Get that in Psalms. Go back to Psalms again. Psalm 58, verse 2. You understand? Let's start there. Psalms 58, verse 2. Watch this. Psalms chapter 58, verse 2. Go ahead. Yea, in heart you work wickedness. Mm -hmm. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. You hear what God is saying? He says, in his mind, he works wickedness. That's what makes him tick. That's what gives him life. Evil gives the white man life. That's what fuels him. Evil, oppression, you understand? Stealing, murdering, killing, raping, you understand? Savagery, that's what makes him tick. He says, he weighs the violence of your hands in the earth. When you look at the level of violence that the white man has done on this earth, you cannot compare it to any nation on this earth. You cannot. That's why the Lord is saying what he's saying right there. Go ahead. Verse 3. Come on. The wicked are estranged from the womb. 
You see that thing? Their soul is estranged from the womb. From the minute they are conceived in their mother's womb, the law says their spirit is not right. Okay, go ahead. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking yeah. lies. You see, they go astray, meaning they go against the what is law. Anything that the Bible says, they go against it, speaking lies. Because right now, this Afri Forum case né, is based on kill the Boer song. So te you telling me that the reason why basically is the art of deception is called deflection. Because what they're doing is that they want to focus on the song. So they want to take off the, the they want, they don't want anybody to focus on the evils that they've done, the robbery, the murder, the killing, the violence that they've done on this earth up, uh, against our people. You understand? The robbing and stealing of land, the raping of resources on the continent. They want to actually equate that to a song are you kidding? This white man is the devil. I'm going to tell you straight up, as the Bible says. Keep reading. Because when Julius says, no, why can't you take responsibility and apologize? That's not going to happen. And I'm going to show you why. Keep reading. Verse 4. Go ahead. They are poison. It's like the poison of a serpent. You see that thing? Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Their job is to poison the earth, the people on the earth, particularly the 12 tribes of Israel, which is us today, called Bantus and Negroes, Hispanics, Native American Indians, because Christopher Columbus did the same thing when he arrived in the Americas against our forefathers, the Native American Indians, the tribe of Gad, the Seminole Indians, the tribe of Reuben, you understand? The Taino Indians, the, the tribe of Asher and so forth, you understand? The Aztecs, the Is Issachar, the so-called Mexican, Zebulon, the Mayans and so forth, the so-called Mayans, that's exactly what they did from Guatemala to Panama. That's what the Christopher Columbus arrived in when the conquistadors, when they arrived over there. That's the same thing that the Spaniards arrived in South Africa. They did the same thing. They were killing. The Lord is letting you know, it says that their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Keep reading. Go ahead. They are like the death adder that stops her ear. That's the key right there. They are like the deaf adder, meaning a deaf snake that stopped at their ear. You expecting what they must take responsibility and say, we are sorry because we killed you. We took your land. We are raping your resources. We raped your women. We were hanging your fathers, castrating them. They will never, they are not going to say that because God says so. It says because it's like a deaf snake. They cannot hear nothing. Julius Malema's lips are moving, but they don't hear, they don't respond to that. This is how they, 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 they will only respond to God's judgment. Keep reading. Verse 5. Watch this. This is what David is King David is saying in the spirit here. Read. Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers. Uh -huh. Charming never so wisely. You see that? It says they will not respond to the voice of charmers. You see, he's, he's trying to charm them. Why can't you take responsibility? Why can't you uh, say you are sorry for what you've done? They are not going to respond to the voice of charmers. You cannot charm them. You cannot expect them that they're going to make things right. It's not in their spirit to do that. That's why they must be put to death by the Most High God. God is going to wipe out the entire Caucasian race on this earth. Only God can do that thing. That's the only time they will respond. Keep reading. Break their teeth, O oh God. That's how, they are going to respond. That's how they are going to respond. That's why it's break their teeth, oh God, in their mouth. That's the only way that the white man will respond. Through violence. And we are not going to do violence to him. The Lord is going to do it. The most high God is going to use these nations that the America trust upon. He's going to what? He's going to use these nations to destroy America and to destroy the empires of the white man. You understand? And once these nations are going to war, which they're about to, that's when the Lord, the black Messiah will crack the sky and he will finish this. He will wipe America. The only thing that's going to be left is going to be a smoke. That said the Lord. Read. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O oh Lord. You see that thing? That's the only way they are going to respond. 
That's the only way they are going to respond. That's what the Lord is telling me. So Julius Malema can continue to charm them. They are not going to respond to this. God is telling you how to get their attention. The most High God is the one that will do it. And how is he going to do it? He's raising us up. We are waking up now. Give me that in Revelation 11 verse 11. The Lord is waking the 12 tribes of Israel up. Then we're going to put fear on the white man and all his European allies that support him. You understand? Read that, Revelation 11 verse 11. Revelation chapter 11 verse 11. Go ahead. And after three days and a half, the spirit mm. of life from God entered into them. That's what's and going on right stood. now. That's what's happening right now. The spirit of the Lord has entered into us now. Go ahead. And they stood upon their feet. Mm -hmm. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. Really, the only reason why we're going to put fear on these nations those laws. The only time we're going to put fear on these nations is when we wake up as the nation of Israel, men in their proper order, their role that God gave them, women in their proper order that their role that God gave them, and we come together, we keep God's commandments, we teach our children, we get married, we observe the Sabbath, we, 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 we plummet the empire from what? By keeping God's commandments. Because when the sisters start wearing dresses, they stop wearing pants, they stop wearing leggings, they stop buying weaves, you understand? They stop blunting their, their hair and their skin. The black man stop pulling his pants up, stop buying cigarette, you understand? Stop smoking weed. Start to get married, marry his women, take care of his children, don't go to the clubs and all that. All these nations are going to fall. Their businesses are going to crumble. The economy will crumble when we start to keep the laws of God. That's what we need to understand what's going on here. Okay, you understand that? So that's what that's the only time when we're going to put fear on these nations. He's not going to be dead on that day when he sees us. So when they see us, that's why when we go to teach, you see I'm seeing a lot of Edomites. They be taking pictures of us when we teach because they know their time of rulership is coming to an end because Jacob is waking up. So they, they have no chance. Understand that. Let's keep playing this thing. And we remain on cut. You're using this term, you, and this is the cash from reality. You want to say that you, me, white people, you are the same as people from 1652, from 350 years ago. You are the you same. You want to say it's the same. You are the same. You are the what? same. All right, so you are the same. Right. They are all the same. They are all the same. I'm going to prove that thing. Julius is right. Julius, my name is right on this. Because you see what this white man is doing? This Edomite is saying, you telling me that um, those white people from 1652, they are, they are, we are all the same from that time until now? Yes, he's right. They are all the same. Because this Edomite lawyer is trying to make it seem like his forefathers are he's different from his forefathers. But he's benefiting from what his forefathers did. All the property that they stolen from us, he's inheriting them. He's got this thing called, he's got a thing called white privilege. That's what he's got. Privilege from what? From our forefathers and foremothers getting robbed, killed, murdered, hung, castrated, and raped, and their possessions stolen from them. That's why he can speak what he's saying. He's trying to make it seem like he's different. No, he's not different. Give me Malachi 1 verse 4. I'm going to show you that they are not different. They are all the same. Because they are all the same race of people. Read what you got. Malachi 1 verse 4. Go ahead. Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. Go ahead. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. This is Esau Edom speaking here. All the Caucasian race. Read. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. They uh -huh. shall build, but I will throw down. And this they is what shall the, call the, them. The most, like, the most like God says, 
that when the white man comes back into power, which is during the Renaissance in 1453, it says they shall build, meaning they will rebuild, they will have technological advances, they'll go to space and so on and so forth. The most High God says he will throw down, he will destroy everything that they are building, everything that they build and still building the law says, I'm gonna destroy it all in one hour. If you read Revelation 18 verse 10, go ahead. They shall build, but I will throw down. And uh -huh. they shall call them the border of wickedness. He says, white people, God says, white people, Esau, Edom, Idumia, today they call themselves Europeans, so-called white people, because they're not white, they are red dragons. The law says they are the border of wickedness. They are the beginning and end of wickedness on earth. Read. And. The people against whom yeah, the Lord no, no, has no. And the what? And they shall call them the border of wickedness. No, 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 come on. And the what? And the people. And the what? And the people. And the people, not, not the person, not the individual, because this Edomite lawyer was trying to make it seem like he as an individual is different. Julius Malema is saying, no, all of you white people, you're all the same. That's what God is saying. And the people, meaning their, their entire nation, and the people, meaning and the nation, go ahead. Against whom the Lord has indignation forever. God says he's got great anger against the entire Caucasian race, not just one of them. Because he's trying to make it seem like he's different from his forefathers. Let's see what the Bible says. Give me the book. Give me the book of Sirach 41 verse 5. Watch this. Ecclesiastes 41 verse 5. Let's see if it's different. Ecclesiastes chapter 41 verse 5. The children of sinners are abominable children. And they that are conversant in the dwelling of the ungodly. Is it, is it the children of sinners are abominable children? The children of sinners is the children, is the descendants of what? The descendants of these white settlers, the colonizers that came over here, they stole our land, our resources, they killed and raped our mothers and so forth. They are the children of sinners because their fathers, we and Van Ribeck and all those were sinners, those were sinful men. Their children are the same as well. That's what God is saying. Children of sinners are abominable children. So this Edomite lawyer, he's an abominable child. Read. And they that are conversant in the dwelling of the ungodly. They are conversant in the dwelling of the ungodly because they converse, they talk amongst each other, they live in the dwelling of the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? They are fathers that came before them. Go ahead. The inheritance of sinners' children shall perish. You see what God is are... saying? The inheritance of sinners' children shall perish because they inherited stolen goods, land, resources. You understand? They are still doing it today. So the Lord is saying the inheritance of sinners' children shall perish, meaning they are going to perish. They are going to pay for what their forefathers have done because they are their forefathers. Read. Right? And their prosperity shall have a perpetual reproach. They are going to have a perpetual, their posterities, meaning their children, they are going to have a perpetual reproach, an ongoing reproach, negativity around them because of what their fathers did, because they are benefiting from what their fathers did by exploiting us. Read. The children will complain of an ungodly father. That's what you are seeing here. This Edomite lawyer is complaining of his ungodly fathers because he's the same and he's benefiting from what his ungodly fathers have done against us. Read. Because they shall be reproached for his sake. You see that thing? Because they will be reproached for his sake. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Give me that in Isaiah 14, verse 20. Isaiah 14, verse 20. Okay, read that. I you say no, 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 no. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Yeah, keep reading read that. Read verse 21. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21. You know what? Read verse 20. 
Isaiah chapter 14, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because mm -hmm. thou hast destroyed thy land and you slain thy people. It says, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. Because this white man, the Lord says, he's going to destroy them like we read in Ezekiel 35. Okay, because thou hast destroyed thy land, they destroyed our land. They're still doing it right now. Go ahead. And slain thy people. They, they killed our fathers and mothers. You understand? From 1652 until today. You understand? Marika and Ashapville. You understand? 1976. You understand? They've been doing that. Go ahead. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Because the white man, he is the seed of an evildoer. The white people on this earth, the Caucasian race, all of them, they are the seed of evildoers. Go ahead. Verse 21. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers. You see that thing? The, this, this God speak. God says, prepare slaughter for the white man's children. For the iniquity of their fathers, for the sins of their fathers. Read. That they do not rise. They do not nor, rise. Nor possess the land. Nor possess the land like they are doing now. Sitting on stolen property. Read. Nor fill the face of the world with cities. Because that's what they are doing now. They conquer. They fill the world with cities that they build on the backs of the slaves. They've been doing it. They're still doing it. Go ahead. For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of you hosts. You what God is saying? God says he will, rise, he will rise up against Esau, Edom, Idumia, the Caucasian race. The Lord says he's going to rise up against them. And how do we prepare slaughter for them? How do we do that? We teach the laws of God. That's how we prepare slaughter for them. Meaning we teach them so that they, we, when we teach our people, guess what? They watch our videos. They know what's coming for them. They know what the Bible says about them. What is their fate? That they're going to be wiped off from the face of the earth. There's going to be no Caucasian person on this earth no more. And the earth will spring forth into singing. When that day comes, the Lord has spoken it, it shall come to pass. So what we're reading here, how do we prepare for them? How do we say the Lord prepare slaughter for his children? We teach the laws of God. So they also, these Edomites, they can know what's coming for them. That's the preparation. Us teaching the laws of God. Them knowing what's their fate. Go ahead. Prepare slaughter for his, excuse me, no, no, Isaiah 22. chapter 15, verse 22. Great. Right. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, mm -hmm. and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant mm -hmm. and son mm -hmm. and nephew, mm -hmm. saith the Lord. Meaning what? They are not going to be no more on this earth. They will not be allowed to, be, to exist on this earth. Give me Obadiah verse 18. Obadiah verse 18. Because what Isaiah is saying is the same thing that Obadiah, uh, Obadiah is saying. Read that. Obadiah verse 18. There's going to come a time where they are, their seat will not be on this earth. It will not exist. That's why they are trying to run away to Mars. We Elon Musk with Jeff Bezos, they are trying to run away. They are not going to escape the judgment that's coming. Read verse 18. Go ahead. Obadiah verse 18. Uh -huh. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, mm. and the house of Joseph a flame, and Wait. the house of Esau for stubble. Because guess what? The Lord is going to rise up against them. Go ahead. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord had spoken it. No, because I've spoken it. For the Lord had spoken it. The Lord has spoken this day. The most High God is saying, there shall, be not, there shall not be any remaining of the house. The house of Esau, meaning the entire Caucasian race. For the Lord has spoken it. Meaning what? There's going to come a time where they are not going to exist on this earth. That's what we, the saints, are patiently waiting for. We want the earth to spring forth into singing. We want the earth to be at rest. When the earth is at rest, we're gonna, we, the saints, who are going to be at rest. So Julius Malema, he needs a flyer so he can understand what's going on. 
You see that thing right there? You're the what? same. All right, so quite unapologetic there in his views. Yeah, let's just fall forward. I want to see the loud. The, the way the sentence is structured, you say, we are not calling for the slaughter of white people, at least for now. That means at some future date, we may call for the slaughter of white people. Is that correct? You know, I'm glad they are using those terms. Eh? You hear the term that this Edomite lawyer is using? Let's <laughs> <be one. laughs> Call for the slaughter of white people. Is that correct? I don't know what's going to happen. So you're saying you are not ruling out that in the future you may very well call for the slaughter of white people. It may not be me. Mm. Could it be you? It could be me, yes, but it may not be me. Yeah, so it could be you. You could, at some future date, call for the I slaughter of white people. I want you to people. hear the words that are being used here. <laughs> He's saying... Do you say, Guti, they are going to be, a, a, you call them for a slaughter of white people? He says, in the future, that could happen. He's saying, it could be me, it may not. You understand? So he wants him to say it out loud. So Julius is saying, I don't know. No, no, we know. And we will prove it. Read the verse again in Isaiah 14. Okay, verse 21. We know. Okay, Isaiah chapter 14. Read it. Come on. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21. Read. Really? Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. We need to enjoy this verse. Read it again. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21. Uh -huh. Prepare slaughter for his children. God, the most that God says, prepare slaughter. For Esau, Edom, Idumia, a.k.a. the so-called white man's children. That's what God is saying. Read on. For the iniquity of their fathers. For the sins of their fathers. We are van Ribeck. We fair wood. We DF Malan. We Herzog. We Pretorias. We are smart. All of these people that I'm mentioning, we Dr. Death. We their person. Again, it's called Dr. Death. Yes, that's them. God is saying, prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers. Read on. That they do not rise, mm -hmm. nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. God says, that must be what must be. That is the preparation that must be done. Hmm. How is this going to take place? Let's see. How is the slaughter of Esau Edom going to take place? I'm going to show you that thing right there. Give me the book of Ezekiel, right? You know what? Give me Isaiah 34 verse 5. This is the slaughter that is going to take place upon the entire Caucasian race. Who's going to do it? Let's see who's going to do this thing. Give me Isaiah 34 verse 5. You see, Julius needs the Bible. <laughs> you see that thing? He needs the Holy Scriptures. Read what you got. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 5. Mm -hmm. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Mm -hmm. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. Read. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. God, the most that God says, his sword will be bathed in heaven. Meaning, Esau's kingdom. It says, behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. Who's Idumia? The entire Caucasian race. Upon the people of my curse to judgment. Because Israel has not been judged for the crimes he's committed. This so-called white man has not paid for his crimes. God is letting you know that his time of judgment is coming. And he can taste it in the air. Because the Israelites are waking up. Keep reading. Verse 6. Go ahead. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. Mm. It is made fat with fatness and Go with ahead. the blood of lambs and goats. Mm. Sacrifices. The fat these, are, these are sacrifices. It says the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. Whose blood? Esau, Idumia, the Caucasian race's blood. Read. 
it is made with it is made fat with fatness and with the mm. blood of lambs and goats Great. with the fat of the kidneys of rams uh -huh. for the lord has a sacrifice in Bozra and a great slaughter in the a land what? of Idumia. A great slaughter. A great slaughter. A great slaughter. There's going to be a slaughtering contest. By who? The Most High God, the Son, the Black Messiah. He says, and a great slaughter. Hold on, let me read this thing. Isaiah 34, verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah, that's Edom's capital, America, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumia. Hmm. Watch this. Give me, give me, give me Isaiah. Give me Isaiah 63, verse 1. Let's see how, how gruesome the slaughter is going to look like. Let's see, because the Bible is very detailed on these accounts. How is Esau Edom going to be slaughtered? God says there's going to be a great slaughter on this nation for all the evils that they've done and the evils they're still doing. Read it. Isaiah 63 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments yes. from Bozrah? With dyed garments from Bozrah. Bozrah is Edom's capital, America, and all their European allies. Wherever the white people are, that's what's coming for them. Mainly, starting with what? America, Babylon the Great. Go ahead. This that is glorious in his apparel, mm -hmm. traveling in the greatness of his strength, Read. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So guess what? The Lord speaking through Isaiah. He is asking the question and he's answering himself. Read. Wherefore art thou read in thine apparel and thy garments mm -hmm. like him that treadeth in the wine fat? He says, why, why is your clothes red? Why is your garments red? And your garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Meaning you just took your, your garment, you dipped it in blood. How, why is your garment look like that? Keep reading. I have trodden the wine press alone. I have trodden the wine press alone. Meaning what? I've been stamping it. I was I was causing great slaughter in what? In the in the land of Bozrah. This is Christ speaking now. Go ahead. And of the people, there was none with me. It is, he was by himself. Read. For I will tread them in mine anger. Oh, and praise. Trample them. The Lord says, hold on, wait, wait. He says, I'm going to tread them in my anger. So the most that God is saying, this is Christ speaking through Isaiah, saying, listen, I'm going to destroy Idumia with my anger because our anger is not enough. No, the Lord's anger. The Lord's anger, you really going to see it on that day. Go ahead. For I will tread them in my anger mm -hmm. and trample them in my fury. Mm. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. Now he's letting you know why his garments are red. He says, my blood will, their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments because of all the killing he's going to do. Go ahead. And I will stain all my raiment. That's the reason why his garment is red. That's why Isaiah is seeing that. He says, he says what? And I will stain all my raiment. He's going to be as if he dipped his clothes in blood. He's going to be dripping with blood. Or what? Because he's coming from the slaughter. Slaughtering who? I do me. Keep reading. Go ahead. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. Mm. And the year of my redeemed is come. You see that thing? The day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeem is come. Who is he redeeming? Give me that in Luke 168. Mm. This is beautiful. This is therapy right here. I'm sorry, brothers. This is therapy, okay? Read what you got. Is it Julius needs a flyer? You understand? Hopefully, Lord's will, he'll get a flyer when we go for Shabdiel, uh, you know, the day of the, that day. Read that. Luke 168. Okay, come on. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Read. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
Mm -hmm. For he has visited and redeemed his people. You see that thing? That's why it says, the day of my redeem is come. The Lord will redeem us from the hands of our enemies. Jump down to verse 71. Go ahead. Luke chapter 1, verse 71. Uh -huh. That we should be saved from our enemies uh -huh. and from the hand of all that hate us. That's it right there. We should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us. That's when the Lord returns. Go back to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63 verse 5. Okay, come on. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 5. And I looked and there was none to help. Mm -hmm. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Really? Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me. Mm -hmm. And my fury, it upheld me. And he says, my anger kept me going when I was slaughtering Bozo. Read. And I will tread down the people in my anger. He says, he says what? I will tread down the people in my anger. So he says he will tread down the people in his anger. So the wine press, you understand, is now telling you what the, who the wine press is. The wine press is Iso Edom Idumia. He says he's going to tread the people in his anger. Come on. And make them drunk in my fury. Mm. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. You see that thing? This is judgment right here. This is righteous judgment that the Lord is going to bring upon them. You understand? So we don't have to worry about nothing. The Lord is with us. Understand that thing, brothers and sisters. The most High God is going to recompense as it is written. Our job, we just must keep the laws of God, hold on and enjoy. The most High God will surely deliver us. Understand that thing. Okay? Now let's keep playing. What will necessitate that? You tell me. I don't know. Why would, you, why would I do that? You've said you could do it in the future. Is that correct? I can't guarantee that I can't do it or I won't do it. So right now, so I'm not ruling out pledge, that possibility. If I asked you to pledge to say, I will never call for the slaughter of white people. Would you make that pledge? Listen, we cannot make that pledge. The Lord says he will slaughter. The most High God says he's going to slaughter them. With He's going to be a great slaughter, a bloodbath. Mm. So give me the book of Job 20 verse 4 because he's trying to coerce him to say, I will never. Mm -mm, don't say that, Julius. Don't be saying stuff like that. Give me that in Job 20. Job chapter 20. Job 20 verse 4. Okay, you know what? Before we get there, hold on. I do have a picture that I want to share. Yes. Oh no, wait, wait. Let's go back. Let me share my screen. It's the Sabbath, so nobody's going nowhere. Okay, who praises? Uh, hold on, let me see. Mm. That's it right there. Yes. Now, read the title. This is the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. The Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. Now, let's go inside of this thing. I want you to read that. This is page 141. Okay. Now, read that. Edom. Edom. Edomites, Edomites read the nation and its people who were the descendants of Esau. Okay, so we know they are the descendants of Esau. So Esau is the forefather of the Edomites, Caucasian race today. Okay, let's move on to the next page. Now, this is page 142 here. Okay, read that. Now, this is their fate. This is the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. This is what the scholars are saying. Read that. Edom figures prom prominently in the prophetic scriptures as the scene of great future judgments. That's what we just read. Go ahead. She is the only neighbor of the Israelites who was not given any promise of mercy from God. You see that thing? You see what the scholars know? It says, Esau, Edom, Idumia, a.k.a. white people, 
is that she is the only neighbor of the Israelites who was not given any promise of mercy from God. That's what God is, that's, that's what we just read in the scripts. You understand? You understand? It says Edom figures prominently in the prophetic scriptures, meaning in the Bible, as the scene of great future judgment. There's going to be a great judgment for the right for the Caucasian race. We read it in Isaiah. You see, they are even quoting Isaiah 34, verse 5 and 6, Isaiah 63. That's what we read. You see that thing? That's what we read. The Lord is letting you know what's going to happen. So this Edomite lawyer trying to say, oh, do you swear and all that? Mm -mm. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. Okay. Now give me Job 20 verse 4. Job chapter 20 verse 4. Mm -hmm. Knowest thou not this of old since man was placed upon earth? Now he's gonna, they're taking us back. Says, says, since, since man was placed on this earth, this is what we all know as the nation of Israel. Go ahead. That the triumphing of the wicked is short. Meaning the rulership of the wicked is short. Is short. 1776, that's when they started to, that's when America was born. You understand? Out of the EU, Britain. Go ahead. And the joy of the hypocrites, but for a moment, their joy is only for a moment. Right now they are rejoicing, but they are also miserable. And they are what? We are putting fear on them because the Lord is waking us up. Read on. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens. In his space his travel. Though they do space travel. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens. 1969 with our, the Apollo. The Apollo 11. The moon landing. When they say the eagle has landed. Those they, they go to the moon. They go to Mars. You understand? What did the Bible say? Go ahead. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds. His head reach unto the clouds. That's the airplane with the Wright brothers in 1903. Okay, come on. Yet he shall perish forever like his own tongue. Mm, that's the fate of the Caucasian race. God says they are going to perish forever like his own poop. Go ahead. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? Meaning the people that will have seen the white man on this earth, when this take place, the people are going to be asking, where is he? Keep reading. Go ahead. He shall fly away as a dream. Mm, that is, that, that's beautiful. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. He says he shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found. You ever had a dream? You wake up, you're like, oh, damn, that was a dream. Right now, guess what? We are in the dream state as a nation, wherever we are scattered. You see that thing? Because our people have not woken up to what's really going on on mass, in, 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 on mass scale. We have not woken up in the, in the way that the Lord says yet. But guess what? Because our people are still spiritually dead. But think about it like this, right? As a nation, once we all understand, oh, wait a minute, how did we get, listen, if when the most high God kindles our spirit, when he gives us new bodies, now our spirits are all going to be changed and all that, we're going to be saying, wait a minute, it will be like waking up from a dream. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be as if you just woke up from a dream and you just discovered, or, you know, I had a dream that white people was ruling over us. Is going to be like that. You brothers understand that? <laughs> yes, sir. It's going to be like that. You're going to be like, what? They ruled over us? Yes. No, no, no. It was just a dream. It's going to be like that. Understand? Understand? Okay. Go ahead. He shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found. Wait. Yay. Okay. He shall be chased away as a vision of the night. Like the nightmare. He's going to be chased away like a nightmare. Because right now, this is a nightmare that we're in. Understand that. This is the longest nightmare ever. This is the longest nightmare we've ever been in. Once the Lord wakes us up and all that, right now he's reviving us. Once he raises us up, gives us new bodies and all that, and kindles our spirits in the blinking, in the, 
in the blink of an eye, guess what? It's going to be like, what the, what the hell? You know, I had a dream that, you know, Esau was ruling over us and we went on slave ships. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Okay? Apartheid happened. Colonization happened. It's going to be like a dream, brothers. Understand that. You understand? The most high God is glorious. He's beautiful. Okay? He's beautiful. And all of this, it will surely come to pass. Okay. Mm. One more, one more, and then we can shut down. Okay? Watch this. Um, here's another one now that we want to go over. Okay, let me share my screen. So this is a court case that is going on. This white man He's murdering. He's on a murdering spree. He's killing kids as part of some satanic ritual that he's performing. And they are, they are positing that there's, there could be more dead bodies. There could be more victims that he has killed. You understand? So pay, pay attention. The mother of a teen murdered in Clava on the Cape West Coast last week is under medical observation after grim new details emerged of his, her son's brutal attack. Uh, the man accused of kidnapping and killing Jeropian van Veek says the 13-year-old was an occult offering in a shock confession to his lawyer. 56-year-old Daniel Smith also admitted to other satanic crimes in the province. Natalie Malchas has more. Satanic crimes, occult. It's in the underbelly of this quaint town that lurked a sordid secret. A self-confessed demon worshipper who was praying. He says he's the self-confessed demon worshipper. What did we just read in Revelation? They worship the devil. They watch the white people worship the devil. They don't worship the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the black man up there with the Afro. They don't worship that one. No. I'm the most vulnerable. Daniel Smith made his first appearance for the kidnapping and murder of 13-year-old Jerobian van Veek, but he admits there were others. We are all constantly... You see? He says he admits that there are others that are involved, meaning what? There are others that he put to death. This is happening in the country, by the way. He is going on right now, okay? looking for missing children and missing persons. The killing of people in the occult practices are real. He has told me that there was. This is the fourth one. I have no, not a lot of details about the others, but I do know it did not happen in Clover. Um, it, 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 it was in Seaport. Mm. Forty-eight hours after a rambunctious Van Veek and a friend were last seen running from Smith's house, human remains were found in a drain on the property. Look at that. They found human remains in this dun is being this dungeon right here. By the way, these are our people. Yes, they call them colors and all. These are Israelites. These things would happen to Israel. Now, must justice be done. Lord, all seek justice. That's a kind that when your kind is my kind and my kind is your kind, all this, all this gemeenschap is by your heart. See, all full same to me. Last Wednesday afternoon, witnesses say Smith ran the boys down in a fit of rage. One of them over in his white bucky and drove an injured child back to his mm. house. Jerobian was never seen again. You will not find the normal clean clues on a murder scene because it was an occult killing. The community has rallied around a traumatized Van Veek family. They're demanding answers for the police's tardy attempts at finding mm. the boy. The matter has been postponed to April 26th for further investigation. Natalie Malchas, Klaver. So, so what we're seeing here is... So what we're seeing here, we see this Edomite who's a serial killer. You understand? He's a self-confessed devil worshiper. But that's biblical because they worship the devil. We read it earlier on. You understand? So what you are seeing here is, I'm going to show you the lawyer now, because that Edomite woman, be honest, that is lawyer. I'm going to show you in the next video what she says. Watch this. It gets better.
The case is not about killing someone because you are angry or racial or anything like that. You will not find the normal clean clues on a murder scene because it was an occult killing. My client is not a sick person as in mental health. You see that? When white people kill, they always come up with all manner of ridiculous excuses, you understand, to justify murder. I want you to understand this. Killing. My client is not a sick person as in mental health problems. He has spiritual problems. Many people does not... So, so now, when white people kill, they've got spiritual problems. He's not a murderer. He's not a monster. No, he's got spiritual problems. You know how many black people, how when, especially black men, when they're involved in heinous crimes, they will never, you will never hear a lawyer or a news uh, anchor speaking about the fact that no, the way he grew up psychologically is not well. Mm -mm. They listen, they, the court case does not even go for law. Anybody notice that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I believe there is a God or that Jesus saved us. Fortunately, I do, because in this case, you are dealing with the opposite spirit, the spirit of darkness and pure evil, where a human being is nothing but a sacrifice instead of the Holy Spirit of goodness. My client got involved in the occult when he was 13 years old, and it happened in Friedendal when he met someone from out of town who gave him stuff about the occult to read. He felt he belonged, he felt part of it. So that is, that is like, all, we have all that problem with people that are lonely and they start feeling part of something, even the gangs, it's work like that. We have to protect the lonely people in society, part of something, even the gangs, it's work like that. We have to protect the lonely people in society. Hold on, when he hold was, on, wait, wait, wait. Are you kidding? Listen, a child is dead and many others so they say that, that we must protect the lonely people. Who do you think they are making reference to? They are making reference to this demonic monster that you are looking at here. He is the lonely person. So it says we must protect the lonely people. You see what happens when white people kill? They are lonely. They have spiritual problems. You see that thing? No, I'm dealing with a dark force. It's never that you are the devil the Bible speaks of. No. They come up with all manner of excuses for them. 19, an occult group from Sea Point showed him how to kill. I can say for uh, that all the people, he told me that this morning, all the people of that uh, cult died. Uh, the last one died in 2009. With, um, the, he, he was taught how to kill with very little blood spill and to incinerate the body and to throw any remains in the sea. It's all about being in control. It's part of the rituals. He wants to be delivered from the evil spirits and I've arranged for a well-known spiritual leader in our community, Jan Oosthuizen, so to assist with that. So a pastor now must intervene. You can't make this stuff up. You cannot make this stuff up. I've asked the court, I am going to ask the court now, that he be kept separate from other inmates for their safety, because I do not know when he will be triggered again. Uh, we will not ask for bail, not at any stage of this trial. This stage, we have to be sure that the community is safe, that no one goes out and burn places down and kill farmers or anything because of erroneous things in the papers and say that a farmer killed it. He's not a farmer. He was, he was never a farmer. He has told me that there was, this is the fourth one. I have no, not a lot of details about the others, but I do know it did not happen in Clover. Um, it, 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 it was in Seapoint. The only thing is what I got from the police, and I only know that he he's a, was a, uh, a train driver. That's all I know. I haven't gone into detail about what he, how long he's, he's been here. But as... Uh, any human being, and I'm also a human being, I'm shocked. This is an evil deed that was done. You can't even imagine. I'm also a father and I'm a grandfather. You can't even imagine what the mother has gone through. When I spoke to her, she couldn't speak. In the tears, I was also traumatized because this is bad. 
As a mayor, you can't just ignore these things. That's why you were elected as a mayor, to see that these things does not happen again. And I will do everything in my power. So, brothers, um, let's dissect this thing. Because this man is killed, you understand? He has killed this child for a sat satanic ritual. Buried, buried the, the, the lifeless body of that child into a ditch in his backyard. And there's, there's alleging that there's other dead bodies that could be popping up. So he's been killing for a while. You understand? Now, you hear the lawyer is justifying everything. Now they even say, no, they must bring a pastor to come and intervene. Hmm? Give me that in Isaiah 5, verse 23. Watch this. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 23. Watch this thing right here. Watch what the Most High God says. Okay. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 23. Wait. Which justified the wicked for reward. You see that thing? They, this system justifies the wicked for reward. That lawyer is going to get paid. But they are to, to do what? To justify the wicked in his wickedness. Read. And take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. You see that thing? They hate the upright. That was a child. What did the child do to them? Nothing. You see that thing? Watch this. Give me Ezekiel. I'm going to show you some more. I'm going to show you some more. You see, when white people kill, something wrong with them psychologically, spiritually, they've got a demon on them or whatnot. Mm -mm. But when we do it, when we see court cases of our people, look at the court case of what was the, the sister that our, 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 our lovely sister that was, was killed and murdered when she was eight months pregnant. The, case, the court case is still going. And then there's no mercy for that brother that did this thing. But on, I'm, I, but with this guy, with this Edomite, we are hearing no, he's got psychological problems. See? He's got a dark force working with him. Or, yeah, we, we know what that dark force, the devil, because that's what they worship. Okay, Ezekiel 35, I'm going to show you something. Ezekiel 35, verse 6. Watch what the Most High God says here. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 6. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood. The most and God shall... says, hold on, wait. The most God says he will prepare Esau unto blood. The Lord will tell you why. Keep reading. And blood shall pursue thee. Blood shall pursue the white man. Go ahead. Since thou has not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Because the most high God that says Sith means since thou has not hated blood, and blood shall pursue thee. The most high God says the Esau Edom, these so-called white people, he says they don't hate blood. That's what the Lord is saying. He says, Sith thou has not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Because they don't hate blood, they don't hate killing. Why is that? Jump down to verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 11. Go ahead. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, uh -huh. I will even do according to thine anger. Because what? They have anger. They have anger. I'm going to show you the, where the anger comes from. The white, the God says, the Caucasian race, Esau, Edom, Idumia, he says, they have great anger against us. Read. And according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. You see that thing? They have anger, envy, and hatred against us, the 12 tribes of Israel. The people they call Bantus and Negroes and Kafirs and monkeys and baboons. Guess what? The Mosa God says they have anger, envy, and hatred against us. Read. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. The Lord will glorify us when he judged Esau. Watch this. Where is this anger, hate, anger, envy, and hatred coming from? Give me the book. Give me the book of Genesis 27. Okay. Give me Genesis 27. I'm going to show you where it comes from. Genesis 27, verse 41. Watch this. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Mm -hmm. 
And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. You see where the hatred comes from? The hatred comes from the when it goes back to Genesis. It says, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. So the reason why you see the so-called white man has anger, envy, and hatred against us, and he does not hate blood when it comes to us, you understand, is because of the blessing that our forefather gave unto our father Jacob, that he will be the one to rule the earth. We are the rulers of the earth. So that blessing is the reason why you see the white man behaves the way that he does. Even at our jobs, even at the, uh, wherever we are, where we had to deal with them, they hate our guts. They just tolerate us. Because of what? Because of this. Because of the blessing that was bestowed upon us. Go ahead. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father I had had. Then mm -hmm. will I slay my brother Jacob. You see that thing? Then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. So that anger has not disappeared. That anger is still there. Because Esau and Jacob, they reconciled and all that when you read the scripts. But the children of Esau and all that, they never stopped. They continued because when we came out of Egypt, what did Amalek do? Because Amalek came behind us and they started to kill our sons and daughters when we came out of Egypt. So obviously the anger didn't stop. They had a perpetual hatred against us. That's what the scripture says. You understand? Watch, watch, what, watch what happens next. Because of that envy, anger, and hatred, because of the blessing, here's the next part of that verse. Read the next verse. Watch this. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. By the Moza, read. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, mm. thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort mm. himself, purposing to kill thee. You see, you see that part right there? It says, as touching thee, that comfort himself, purposing to kill us, to kill thee. You see what comfort, what would the white man find comfort? He finds comfort in killing us. That's what the Bible is telling you right there. It says, as touching thee, that comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. The most High God says, they find comfort in killing the children of Israel. Why do you think what happened in 1976 when they were slaughtering children? In 1960, Sharpville, you see dead bodies everywhere. During the transatlantic slave trade, during 1652 when Van Riebeck arrived here, hmm? Marikana, you see dead bodies everywhere. Inokim Kijima, you understand? You see dead bodies everywhere. Colon when they colonized us, when they took our lands and our houses, you understand? During the 60s, the 80s, the 90s even, the 2000s, they were slaughtering us using chemical and biological warfare here in South Africa to, stellar, to sterilize us during tear gases, to put, uh, to put drugs in our community, you understand? Ecstasy and cocaine and so forth. You understand? Putting abortion, they are putting abortion clinics everywhere now. You understand? Bottles store everywhere. So the black man gets drunk. The black man don't take care of his children and so forth. You understand? The black woman commits abortion. The black man gets drunk. They put guns in our community. We kill each other. Black men don't manufacture guns. Black men don't manufacture cigarettes. Where does it come from? Where do all these things that the black men don't make, where do they come from? Because the Lord says they, they find comfort in slaughtering us. That's what the Lord is telling you right there. So that's what we're seeing in this video. I mean, a child is dead, was murdered gruesomely by this Edomite. And the lawyer is justifying the act, the evil, demonic, abominable act that this demon, this monster has done, talking about, no, um, he's lonely. We must protect the lonely. Now they want to bring a pastor to come and minister unto him. No, he's got a demon on him and so forth. What the hell is that? Give me that in Habakkuk chapter 1. That's why our forefather Habakkuk said this in the spirit. Watch this. Okay. Because I've got daughters, man. What the hell is this? 
Give me a note in Habakkuk 1, verse 3. Read what you got. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 3. Read. Why dost thou show, thou show me iniquity and mm -hmm. cause me to behold grievance? Because that's what we see right now. The same thing that our forefather Habakkuk was asking the Lord, that's the same question we're asking. Go ahead. For spoiling and violence are before me. Mm -hmm. And there are that rise be up and there are that rise up strife and contention. He said there are that rise up strife and contention because we're seeing there for spoiling and violence is before us. A child was gruesomely murdered by a monster. You understand? A murderous red dragon murdered this child. You understand? Gruesomely. They say the mother cannot even talk. Keep reading. Go ahead. Therefore, the law is slack and is judgment. Right? The law, the law is slack. The law is slack. They are making excuses for him. They say he's lonely, must be protected. You can't make this a sharp man. Read. Therefore, the law is slack and judgment does never go forth. Mm -hmm. For the wicked does compass about the righteous. Therefore, Wrong judgment proceeded. You see that? Therefore, wrong judgment proceeds because the wicked compass about the righteous. Because Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Cape Town, and all that, racism is on an all time high. That's why you can see demonic activity like this. Now the community is in an uproar because they don't know, they don't understand what the hell is going on. You see that thing? The most high God is speaking through Abakuk here. That's what we're seeing, it says, because the righteous, that the wicked compasses about the righteous. Watch this, one last game. It's highlighted in blue. I was looking for that. Okay, Ezekiel 7 verse 24. Let's get there. Ezekiel 7 verse 24. Read that for me. Okay, watch this. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 24. Go ahead. You know what? Wherefore? Hmm. Read, whoa, whoa, whoa. Read verse 23. Let's start there. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 23. Mm -hmm. Make a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes. Stop and right the city. There. Hold on, it says make a chain because the land is full of bloody crimes. Who's committing these bloody crimes? Esau, Edom, Idumia, murderers, red dragons. They are the ones that are what that are causing the land to be full of bloody crimes. Right? When they took our land, our resources, you understand? And they took our culture and our book. They gave us white Jesus. Go ahead. And the city is full of violence. The city is full of violence. Read. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen. And Stop they right shall... The, the law says he will do what? I will bring the worst of the heathen. The law says he's going to bring the worst of all the heathens that he created. The law says the worst of the heathen is the one that is going to take our land, our resources, kill our mothers, our fathers, rape our children and our, our sisters. The worst of the heathen. Who's that? The Caucasian race. They are the worst of the heathens. Go ahead. And they shall possess their houses. They possess our houses now. They kicked us out of the best lands. Now they are dwelling in the best lands. We dwell in the ghettos now. Go ahead. I will also make the pomp, the pomp of the strong to cease, and the their pride, holy place. The pomp, the pomp is the pride. The pomp, the pomp is the pride. The Lord says He will make the pomp of the strong to cease. Go ahead. And their holy places shall be defiled, because our holy places was defiled, because the nations are defiled. So they defiled our holy places, like they are doing today in the land of Israel. You understand? There's a Tel Aviv gay parade every year in the land of Israel. So they are polluting their holy land. You understand? Jewish people over there. White people calling themselves Jewish. That's what the Lord is saying. It's the Lord says they are violent on the earth. They are children of fools, children of base men. They are violent on the earth. The worst than anything on this earth. That's what the Lord says. The worst of the heathen. They are the ones that are going to be round about us. You understand? They are the ones that are going to come past us about. That's what the Most High God is saying. 
Okay, I'm going to end the class right there. All praises to the most high God. Let's break bread in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Okay. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he prayed it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in the remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye to show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.